Beachhead, Invasion Earth, written by Chris Lowry, narrated by Rob Lay. Copyright 2017, Grand Ozarks Media, all rights reserved. Chapter 1 Their dad woke them up in the middle of the night. He busted into the room shouting and cursing. Light from the hallway lay in a slash across the floor between two twin beds pressed against each wall. His boots clomped on the hardwood as he pounded in and kicked the footboards. Jake! His grovelly voice was laced with fear. Mark, get up! Jake Russell was 16 years old with a long, lanky body made for basketball and reaching stuff on the top shelf. While he didn't mind helping for the stuff kept up high, he detested basketball and dreamed of being a quarterback on the football team. Jake knew with his height he could see over the offensive line and pick out any receiver with ease. The problem was in throwing the ball. He sucked. He rolled out of bed and plopped two giant-sized 16 feet on the cold floor. What is it? Emergency. His dad dropped his voice to a whisper and shook his younger brother Mark awake. Mark, wake up. You boys get dressed and get downstairs quick. The whisper scared Jake more than the rough entry into the room. He was used to his dad yelling, especially at him. But when things got quiet, Jake knew some serious crap was going down. He slipped into a worn pair of jeans and put on fur-lined moccasins he wore for house shoes. Up, Mark, he yelled. Get up. Mark had always been a heavy sleeper, and waking him in the middle of the night was like trying to steer the Titanic away from an iceberg, slow and laborious. Jake kept a squirt gun on the nightstand for mornings when his brother was especially slow and deployed the use now. Two quick pulls of the trigger sent streams of water up one nostril and across the forehead of his 13-year-old sibling and earned Jake a squeal of protest. Dad said, come on, Jake grunted. The communication between the boys often employed grunts, and when they proved ineffective, devolved into punches, kicks, and noogies. Even though Jake was taller, he was loath to admit Mark's thick-fingered hands were masterful at the noogie delivery. Move it, he grunted again and slipped into a flannel shirt. Mark swung his legs over the side of the bed and slipped a t-shirt on with his pajama pants. He felt around for his slippers as he watched his brother walk out and debated lying his head down again. A trickle of water dripped down his nose, and he decided he didn't want to face that again. He could only find one shoe, so he skipped them and padded down the wooden steps on bare feet. His dad sat on the plank table in the kitchen, a fresh-brewed pot of coffee on the table. He gripped a huge mug and calloused hand so tight that it made his large, walnut-sized knuckles pop out. Dad was a huge bear of a man, as tall as Jake, but built thick like Mark. Each boy pulled a distinctive attribute from their father in the looks department, Jake with his height and eyes, Mark with his girth and heavy brow. Both were as stubborn as their old man, which led to some really impressive standoffs around the house his father built. It had been easier when Mom was around, but she took off three years ago with a traveling salesman and lived now somewhere near Vegas. The television glowed blue on the wall in the kitchen. The sound turned down. It was tuned to a science fiction movie, which Mark found weird because he knew his dad loved the History Channel and pretty much nothing else. He plopped into his seat across from Jake and looked at the clock on the wall. Two in the morning. What's going on, Dad? Jake asked as he helped himself to a cup of coffee. He poured two large dollops of creamer into the cup and stirred it with his finger. Dad nodded towards the television and unmuted it. The East Coast is under siege, and reports are coming in that the West Coast is under attack as well. The Lick Offensive has moved from Mars and reached Earth. This station will stay with you reporting to keep you informed. The television clicked over to static as an explosion rippled through the news station. Dad reached up and flipped to the next station. 
reporting live from Miami, where the first lick ship entered the atmosphere 10 minutes ago. So far, their smaller aircraft have remained inside the battleship, but our expert tell us, wait, something is falling from the ship. The camera moved up in a shaky zoom and locked into the image of a black blur that dropped from the belly of the ship. It struggled to keep up and keep in focus, and when it finally did, the image coalesced into what looked like a bomb. It landed with a concussive thud outside of the camera's view, and as it panned back onto the reporter, she screamed as a wave of flames rolled across her and blotted out the image. That station, too, grayed out to a static wall. Dad hit mute again. It's been happening over and over, he said. I've been turning channels and watching it. His voice trembled, and he took a sip of coffee in a shaking hand. London, he continued. Paris. New York. All the East Coast, they're saying. All the West Coast, too. Are they near us, Dad? Jake asked. Chicago. St. Louis. New Orleans, said Dad. At least as far as I can tell. They keep knocking out stations. What about the internet? Mark slid out of his seat and grabbed a tablet off the charger on the kitchen counter. He deftly glided through site after site, live feeds reporting panic and mayhem when he could find them. What are we going to do? Jake asked. Are they coming here? Dad nodded. I want you boys to get up to the cabin, he said. All of us, you mean? Mark set the tablet down. Get upstairs and get dressed. Get some winter things together, and I'm going to pack up the pantry. We're going to hole up in the cabin until we can figure out what's going on. We know what's going on, Dad. Jake stared across his coffee cup at his father. The Licks have won on Mars, which means they wiped out the Space Force. If they're taking our major cities, we're being invaded. Yep. Dad sighed and drained the last of his coffee. He poured the rest of the pot into his mug and went through the motions of making another pot. Aliens invading Earth. He never thought he'd see the day. If they were going to pack up and run, he'd need more coffee before the night was done. Chapter 2 Dad pulled the truck through the yard and close to the back porch. He sent Mark and Jake upstairs to fill their duffel bags with warm clothes while he grabbed every bag he could find and shoved all the food from their pantry into them. When the boys came downstairs, he had them begin loading the back of the truck. Jake grabbed extra blankets from the linen closet, while Mark went into the garage to grab their sleeping bags. They had bedding at the cabin, but Dad insisted they have more since he wasn't sure how long they would stay. While the boys loaded the last of the gear, Dad unlocked his gun cabinet and took out the two rifles, a shotgun, and a pistol. He swept the ammunition into a backpack and cinched it shut. Jake, Dad said, grab a couple of books to read. Dad, I don't want to read, Jake sighed. His father had tried for years to get him into the habit of reading, but it had never stuck. Jake preferred to be more active and play games on his PlayStation than stick his nose between bits of dead tree with print on it. I grabbed a shelf full. Mark piped in. Suck up, Jake muttered. Mark was as much of a book lover as his dad and kept a couple of shelves in their room with material to be read. There won't be TV or games to occupy you up there, son, his dad reminded him. Do as I say. Jake shuffled upstairs and grabbed a copy of The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn and The Count of Monte Cristo off the shelf. He needed to read those for school anyway. At the last moment, he stuck a well-worn copy of a science fiction thriller, Epic, into his backpack as well and trudged back downstairs. Mark and Jake watched their dad do a quick inventory in his head as he scanned the kitchen and living room. He looked through the open door at the truck. Hey, Dad. Yes, Mark. How are we going to keep up with the news if we don't have TV? Dad snapped his finger and stepped to the bureau near the front door. He dug out a large radio with a handle on the side. Good thinking, Mark. Thanks, Dad. 
Mark was unsure what he did. Let's roll. Dad led them out of the kitchen door. He locked it behind them and took a long look at the house before he slid in behind the wheel. He wasn't sure when they would be back. Maybe after winter in the woods. Maybe never. This home was something he built for his ex-wife. A place where they could raise their kids in a small town and teach small town values like the ones he grew up with. But she left him for another man, and ever since, it just felt like a house. A house he might never see again. He dropped the truck in gear and slowly pulled away, unsure how he felt about that. The cabin was 40 miles away in the foothills of the Ozark Mountains. He knew the interstate was going to be packed with individuals like himself trying to get clear of the city, any city. The best bet would be to take one of the smaller two-lane highways, but that presented its own set of problems. Still, it would be better to take the chance on a traffic jam on a scenic byway than get trapped and crushed of what was left of humanity on the interstate. It might add a few hours to what was supposed to be a short trip, but was a much better price to pay. Chapter 3 Dad turned right into a side street and cut away from town to take the highway north. He would have to cut east and then north again in a zigzag pattern, but at least this part of the road was clear. He kept practicing gratitude for five miles when they hit the roadblock. It wasn't a traffic jam as he feared, but something worse. Two sand-colored Humvees straddled the road, with two more on either side of the grass creating a wall that forced them to stop. Soldiers in the back of the Humvees on the side swung mounted 50 caliber machine guns towards the cab of the truck. Dad, Jake whispered, You boys don't move, said Dad. They were behind a sedan with a couple and a young baby. As they watched, a soldier dragged them out of the doors while another searched the car. Dad slipped the truck into reverse. Hang on to something, he grunted. Three soldiers ran up beside the truck from a hiding place in the woods, their rifles aimed inside the cab. Don't you move, the lead soldier screamed. Put it in gear now. Dad popped the gear shift up in park and lifted both of his hands. Jake and Mark followed his example. Out of the truck, the soldier shouted. Out on my side, Dad said in a soft voice. He opened the door and stepped out. The soldier shoved him back towards the woods as Jake and Mark joined him. What did we do? One of the soldiers peered into the truck bed and his face split into a maniacal grin. Jackpot, boys. The others inspected the food, weapons, and gear piled into the back of the truck while the soldier who screamed at them advanced on them with his weapon drawn. We are commandeering your truck, he informed Dad. You can't do that. Jake shouted. The gun tracked in his direction, but Dad stepped in front of the boy and blocked him. Just don't hurt the boys, he said. The soldier glared over the barrel of his rifle, then lowered it slightly. Keys, he demanded. In it. Get moving, the soldier motioned them back towards the town. But Dad, Jake snorted. Dad grabbed Mark and Jake by the arm and led them away from the roadblock. What are we going to do? Mark whimpered. The man from the sedan shoved one of the soldiers away from his car. The 50 cal swung his way, but there was no need. One of the others lifted his rifle and sent two shots into the man, his body flopping backwards into the ditch. His wife screamed. Dad rushed the boys as fast as they could walk. Whatever they say... Dad said. After a couple of hundred yards, he pulled them into a jog and led them back towards the street they turned to their house. He stopped on the corner and did a quick assessment. The roads were still empty as people absorbed the news in their homes, but that wouldn't last for long. We still need to hurry, he said to Jake. What about those soldiers? Jake glared back in the direction they had ran. If the soldiers are turning into robbers... They've lost central command structure. Murderers too, Mark added. And murder, sighed Dad. They took our rifles and supplies. 
He ran one of his hands across his eyes. We need to get to the cabin, he said after a moment. I can see now that it's more important than ever to hide out while we figure out the next step. But Dad, they shouldn't get away with it. I know, son, but they will. They're better armed and willing to kill. That gives them an advantage. We could fight back. No, said Dad. We're going to hide out in the cabin. We're not fighting anyone. Not soldiers, not aliens, not each other. Okay? You have to listen to me and do as I say. Okay, Dad, Jake deflated. But it's still not right. It's not. All right, this is what we need to do. Jake, your friend Tommy, go wake him up and get him to take you to the cabin. Bring his family too so he'll go. Make sure you clean out their food and supplies just like we did, but take a different road. You watch for any military roadblocks or anything that looks out of the ordinary. If you see that, turn around and go a different way. Got it? What are we going to do? Mark asked. We're going with him. But Dad, I'm going back to the house to get the rest of the rifles so we have protection. I'll use one of your bikes to make it to the cabin. Is it a good idea to break us up, Dad? Jake asked. You could go to Tommy's with us and we could drive back here. We'll get more done if we split up. I'll be halfway to the cabin by the time you boys get there. Chapter 4 Jake sat up in his cot and wiped his eyes. He glared around the almost empty barracks set up in a rough-hewn cabin in the woods and blinked back the memories. He had been dreaming about his dad and his brother. Back at the beginning. Back before the world died. He glanced over at the empty set of bunk beds against the wall. Patrol was still out. Otherwise, two of his fellow rebels would be sleeping and Jake would be in a shallow foxhole, man in a fifty cal aimed at the only dirt road that led to the cabin. He swung his feet over the edge of the cot and stood up. There would be no more sleep for him, especially as he didn't want to return to the dream. Mark had been there too, Dad and Mark. He hadn't seen either of them for three years, maybe four he thought he might be 20, was probably 20. Keeping time didn't matter so much in the rebellion against their alien overlords. Jake moved to a five-gallon plastic bucket in a sink, a rubber hose connected to the bottom that snaked outside to reuse the gray water. He used his hands to scoop water onto his face and slick back his long hair. For a moment, he wished for a mirror, something, Anything to look at his face, to catch sight of the eyes he knew looked just like his dad's, a way to connect with the man he remembered in the dream. The door to the room opened, and the captain stuck his head in. You're up? Don't sound surprised, Jake shot back. Happens every day. Captain Summerlin gave him a tight grin. Patrol's not back? Shit. Shit is right. He looked back over his shoulder at the bunk beds beside his cot. Rodriguez? Walker? Summerlin nodded. The last time a patrol went missing was two weeks ago, either picked up by the licks or gone AWOL. We know either way, Jake asked in a softer voice. Summerlin shook his head. Gear up, his commander instructed and shut the door. Jake shivered in the frigid air that still leaked through the cracks in the wood frame of the door. Winter was harsh and had been harsher since the licks landed. Something to do with the exhaust from their ships and its interaction with the atmosphere. Weather was funky all over, but winter was the worst. Freezing for months, water iced over. Unless you counted summer, he thought as he slipped into his boots and shrugged on layers of clothing. Summer was miserable, too. The sun burned through the thin air, creating a hot box of humidity and temps that soared into the hundreds. A killing heat, they called it. At least they weren't at the equator. Jake picked up his rifle and checked the ammunition. No one survived in the tropics anymore. 
They were cooked out a long time ago. He pressed the door open and winced at the light outside. The wince made him stumble and he tripped over the door frame, falling forward. Splintered wood chipped from the cabin and sprayed him. He heard the boom of a rifle seconds after and kept falling, turning it into a roll that carried him away from the door and under cover of the barracks. Captain, he screamed. Summerlin lay in the dirt on the ground in the front of the steps, left hand holding a hole in his neck, the right clawing at the ground. He rolled his head toward Jake, lips moving like a fish gasping out of water, blood squirting between his grimson-soaked fingers. His eyes locked on the man under the cabin and held there as light faded from them. It wasn't like going to sleep. Jake grumbled as he fumbled his rifle up and aimed towards the woods where the shot had originated. Licks were bad. Just about the worst. But even with all of humanity on the brink of extinction, there were still pockets fighting each other. Or robbing or killing, Jake amended as he snugged the stock to his shoulder and sighted down the barrel. The shadows under the trees were still dark. If they fired again, he could zero in on their muzzle flash and return fire. But they didn't. He strained his ears to listen for anything. The sound of boots, voices muttering, but he heard nothing. Where is everybody? He had time to wonder. Then a lick stepped out of the trees. The sight of the alien froze his finger on the trigger. Licks used laser weapons, formidable foreign objects that Jake or any other human had yet to master. This one had a blaster in its clawed hands, aimed towards a cabin where Jake was hiding. A human stepped out of the woods behind it. This one had a rifle, maybe the rifle that killed Summerlin. Jake sighted on the man's head. He stood next to the lick, two feet shorter than the alien invader. His skin was smooth, young face brushed with black stubble compared to the lizard-like scales that covered the giant next to him. Jake danced the sight from one head to the next, practicing a move. Licks were fast, so better to shoot him first. By the time the sound reached the man next to it, he would be splattered in head juice and gore, flinching away. Jake practiced one more time, lined up on the lick, and squeezed the trigger. His shot was thrown off when clawed hands grabbed his ankle and yanked him from under the building. A second lick held him upside down, chest heaving in what Jake could only describe as a laugh. Hissing issued from its pointed snout, forked tongue tracing the air. Jake tried to lift the rifle to shoot it, but the clawed hand batted it away. The human yanked his pistol out, fired two shots into the alien's knee, and was dropped. Jake crashed to the ground, folding in half and got the wind knocked out of him. No time to breathe. He rolled over, struggled to his knees, and sent a third shot into the yellow slit eyes glaring at him. He turned to fight some more, to kill the next lick, but it was too late. The human from the woods pounded up behind him. Jake turned, tried to bring his gun to bear and stop him, but the man cracked him across the side of the skull with his rifle and everything went dark. Chapter 5 I wish you would make my job easier. I'm only going to have my drones come in here and conduct a thorough search. The voice was robotic, sent through a translator box worn around his throat. Were my drones to find anything, it would certainly make you look bad in the eyes of the overlord. If you do this for me, if you make my work go easier, then I assure you my men will no longer return to harass your family. The yellow eyes stared at him. The lick sat at the table he had built with his own two hands from fallen trees on the edge of his property. He had milled the wood, planned it, sanded it soft, just so his daughters would have a place to eat their dinner. Meager though it was, soup mostly. There was a lot of soup. And now this interloper was sitting at his table, drinking tea. Not really drinking it, he amended. Aliens didn't consume human food, not that they had seen and shared. 
The lick asked for tea as a power play. Do this for me. There was no refusal. You will have proven yourself loyal to the order, the voice continued. But I also will assure you, Mr. Rubenstein, that should you now choose to make my job more difficult, you will have proven yourself an enemy of the order and an enemy of mine. The three-fingered claw reached across the wood plank table and set the delicate teacup down with a tiny clink in the saucer. Do you wish now to declare yourself an enemy of mine? Rubenstein stared at the claws on the tip of each finger. Razor sharp and this close, he could see the grooves in the nail, channels that funneled flesh up and away when it scratched. He thought about those claws against the skins of his three children, ripping into them as they carved out chunks of skin and muscle. He thought about their screams that would echo across the peaceful farm he had carved on the edge of the wood and the glee in the lick commander's slit yellow eyes. Rubenstein did not wish to see anyone harmed. He said so. I don't want to see it. The lick nodded. The gesture looked strange on his alien visage. Of course, he said in the robotic voice. There would be no need to watch if you have proven your friendship to me. Rubenstein glanced at the floor. There was a hidden room beneath the house, used as a stop on a sort of underground railroad for rebels and anyone the new order deemed an enemy. His wife had demanded they participate. Our duty, she had whispered into his ear many nights as they lay together and she stroked his hair. Since the aliens invaded, there was no more work, no more television, nothing to distract from each other except the extinction of the human race. His three children were their fight against that. But her death he blamed solely on the licks, a simple cold. Antibiotics could have cured her, but there were no more. He had tried on the black market, but those were reserved for soldiers injured in fighting the invaders. A kind medic had given him seven pills. It wasn't enough. She died because the licks invaded, which is how he ended up with three men in his basement, for the memory of her. But how did the commander know? Who had betrayed him? He kept his eyes drilled into the floor. He could imagine the men below, eavesdropping on the conversation as they stared at the wood plank ceiling. They had not shared their names, nor had he asked. Just a knock on the door in code. He sent his daughters into the only other room in the house with instructions to shut the door, then open the door to the outside. The men stepped through, and he ushered them to a trap door in the floor, closing it after them. That was it. No words exchanged. Hardly a look. And now, the lick commander was here, threatening his daughters over men he didn't know. Rubenstein licked his lips. He reached for his own cup of tea, untouched this whole time, and took a long swallow. He placed it back on the table with a tiny clink and pointed at the floor. The lick followed the end of his finger and looked down. Rubenstein moved his finger twice to emphasize the location of the alien's quarry. The lick's tongue flicked out, tasted the air, and flicked back in. His yellow eyes moved over Rubenstein. Take your daughters outside, the translated voice hissed. Rubenstein pushed back from the table and gathered his children around him. The lick commander opened the door to let them out, and once they were outside, hissed a command to the four lick soldiers that had accompanied him to the clearing. They tromped into the house. The commander pointed to the floor and stepped back. The soldiers watched him with their eyes, blasters aimed at the floor. He made a motion with one of his claws, and they opened fire. Smoke filled the small house, leaking through the open windows. Rubenstein listened as the blast scorched their way through the floor he had laid himself, where he had watched his children learn to walk, where he had sat and taught them to read in front of the crude stone fireplace. The licks blasted through it, and into the narrow room below. He heard three shots fire back, the sound of gunpowder loud and crude next to the almost elegance of the laser pews. Run, 
he whispered to the girls and sent them scampering into the woods. He gave them a few steps head start, remaining behind to tackle any alien that came through the door. But the noise of the firefight inside kept them occupied and hid his family's escape. Rubenstein sprinted after his girls. He watched the oldest almost make the trees before a red beam lanced into her torso and sent her into a sprawling skid to fetch up against an oak. He drew a breath to scream as a second bolt hit his second child and knocked her into a dead heap. Rubenstein didn't feel the blast that hit him and cooked the inside of his torso in a miniature explosive geyser of boiled blood and steamed organs. He plopped down onto his knees in the mud and had just enough oxygen left in his brain to register that his youngest child would make it to safety before he pitched over. She did not. The lit commander stepped out of the cabin and motioned his soldiers to follow him. Chapter 6 Lieutenant William Bonney was average height with whipcord muscles outlined under his thin skin stretched taut. He gathered eight men in front of him in a dirt scrabble courtyard set away from a warehouse. The warehouse looked abandoned and derelict, the work of many to keep it that way. It was designed to be ignored. It was staged to be overlooked. It was an HQ of sorts, one where what was left of high command of planet Earth gathered to plan raids, sorties, and battles. There was much planning from the men who had assumed leadership roles when the first and second batches of leaders were rounded up and shot by the licks. The aliens landed, used the off-joked-about phrase, take us to your leaders, and promptly blasted them into bits and pieces of boiling steam. Just to be sure there was no mistake in their intent, the Lick shuttlecraft lifted off the ground and strafed the crowd as it took out the military accompanying the world leaders, almost two companies of soldiers from different countries. Then they turned on the crowd. The second batch of leaders were less auspicious in their meeting with the alien invaders, but they were hunted and found and destroyed. The third group didn't call themselves much, and if they did, it was only among solid walls and blacked-out windows lest a satellite pick them out for destruction. They led by proxy, planning large and small-scale battles. The trouble was they had few men left trained to carry out their battle plans. It became an exercise in theory that evolved into a war of attrition. The licks hunted. The survivors hid, or cooperated, or died. There was a lot of dying. The aliens seemed intent on ridding the earth of humans and had half the 7 billion population in three short years. That was a lot of good people gone, thought Bonnie as he stared at the eight men assembled in front of him. They were of varying ages, all dressed in rags and cast-offs that were common among survivors still living that day. The weapons were scratched, battered, most second-hand like the clothes but he liked the gleam in their eyes. I am Lieutenant William Bonney, he told them, his blue eyes squinting in the harsh sunlight. You may be tempted to refer to me as Billy the Kid because of the moniker I share with that particular historical figure. I will encourage you not to yield to that temptation. You may call me Lieutenant. You may call me Sir. You will not call me Billy. You will not refer to me as the Kid. Any of you got a problem with that? No one answered, though there was a stirring among the ranks that felt like they were on the verge of laughter. Now, I know what you're thinking, the LT drawled. You're thinking this is a job for a fucking SEAL team. Well, I'm here to tell you, brother, the SEAL teams are dead. Delta Force, dead. Army Rangers, maybe a couple of them left, but the rest... Deader than shit. He glanced at the group assembled in front of him. You're what's left. One of the boys raised his hands. This ain't class, Waldo. You don't have to raise your hand. Sir, my name is... Now look, Waldo. Do I look like I give a shit what your name is? I could call you damn near anything, and you're going to answer to it. 
Now, why don't you put your fucking hand down so I can get done with my speech? I memorized it and everything. Waldo glanced at his own hand and slowly dropped it by his side. The tallest man behind him, a big hulk of muscle with black hair and thick eyebrows, snickered. You think that's funny? The LT shoved between Waldo and the soldier next to him. He came to the tall man's chin, half his size and width. The soldier looked down at the part in the LT's hair and snickered again. Yeah, he said in a thick, deep voice. I do think that's funny. What are you going to do about it? The LT punched him in the nuts. As he collapsed to the ground, he drew back his foot and kicked him in the stomach. Now the tall man was laying in the mud, turning a weird shade of purple as he tried to breathe but couldn't. The LT bent down and rested his forearm on a knee as he watched the black-haired man gape. What about that? You think that's funny? He didn't get an answer. Y'all come here and watch this, he said, even though he didn't need to. All the other seven men had their eyes locked on the big man as he finally sobbed in a breath, one hand cradling his crotch, the other his stomach. I want y'all to see this good. The LT held out his hand. At first, the tall man flinched. After a moment, when he realized the hand wasn't going to punch him or slap him, he lifted his own massive hand. The LT gripped him and helped him to his feet. I got hit in the nuts with a fastball once. Wasn't paying attention to the pitcher trying to take out a man leading off first, the LT advised them. Hurts, don't it? The tall man nodded. You like baseball? You look like a damn football player. But those shoulders say baseball. I'm going to call you Babe Ruth. He got another nod as the man still struggled to get his breath back. All right, Babe and Waldo, you two are my right-hand man. Mans. Men. Right-hand men. Get these fuckers lined up so I can finish my speech. The LT strutted back to the front of the group. Waldo waved three of the men into a straight line on the forward row. Babe grunted them straight in the back. Sir, said Waldo, what is our job? Bushwhacking guerrilla soldiers, the LT shouted. Your job is killing licks. Huh, Babe muttered. What's that, Babe? Bonnie marched in front of the short line of men, circled around them like a shark. Do you think the lick cares what you think? I know damn well I don't, and if I don't, then the lick sure as hell won't. But we will make them care. We will make them know you by name, Babe. When they put their little lick babies to bed at night and pull the covers up tight, every fucking one of them will check the bed and closets to make sure the babe isn't hiding to get them while they sleep. One of the men in the front row licked his sweating lip, eyes darting around as he searched for the LT circling them. Bonnie stopped in front of him. What's your name, son? D David, the boy stuttered. Davy Crockett, you don't look old enough to shave, son. How old are you? He didn't let Crockett answer. Don't answer that, Crockett. You think I give a damn how old you are? You ever seen a lick at war? They don't care how old you are either. The lick kills women. The lick kills children. The lick has no humanity because they ain't fucking human. They are lizards. They are snakes. And growing up in the Ozarks, you know what we did with snakes, Crockett? No, sir, the boy stammered. We cut their fucking heads off. Every fucking one of them. Snake is good for one thing, Crockett. Making boots. LT glanced down at the worn-out hiking boots the boy wore. Wool socks peeking through the threadbare top. Looks like you could do with a good pair of boots, Crockett. Yes, sir. He turned to face the group and glared at them. His right hand strayed to a sheath on his leg and pulled out a 12-inch Bowie knife with a carved wood handle. Jim Bowie himself gave my great-grandfather a couple generations back this here blade. He twisted it in the sunlight so the men could get a good look. Said he was going to knead it up in them Ozark hills before Jim run off to the Alamo 
and got killed defending our freedom. He held the knife still so they could get a close look. Freedom we don't got no more. Freedom the lick has taken from us. I aim to take it back, and you boys are signed up to do it with me. His ice blue eyes drilled into each of them, bouncing from one man to the next. Our plan is to pull from the annals of history and become terrorists. We are going to borrow from our native ancestors and hunt them in their sleep. We will attack their patrols. We will leave carnage and destruction wherever we go. And we will deliver a calling card with each route. Every single one of you men owe me 1,000 lickheads. One for every day since they landed on my planet. You signed up to make them gone. Babe coughed in the back row. You want us to cut off their heads, sir? Babe got his voice back, fellas. All's gonna be right in the world. Hell yeah, babe. I want you to cut off their heads. You ever seen a headless horseman before? Ain't natural. Now, I don't know if licks give a shit about their heads being gone. We ain't got many scientists left to see if it grows back like a lizard's tail. But babe, LT smiled, if that head does grow back, you bend down and cut that son of a bitch off for me again. We're going to call that a twofer. Chapter 7 Jake woke up with another headache. He lay strapped to a table, the hard metal surface cold under his numb skin. He was naked on the table and had been since he woke up. The first time. It had been months, maybe years since then. He didn't know. Had no way of knowing. He couldn't remember. All he knew was they would come in and the pain would start. That's all he associated with being awake. For years or days, he would wake up. The door would slide open. Two humans and a lick would step through. The lizard man would stare at him with slit eyes, tongue flicking in and out to taste the air. The humans would hurt him. He asked them why once. At least he thought he did. His voice, raw from screaming, begging, pleading, he asked them why. The small one flinched. A short, bald man with soft hands and a paunch. It made Jake wonder. Who had enough food to have a gut? Everyone he knew was on the verge of starvation. Not just soldiers, but every single person he met. Food was a luxury almost. Everything was soup. Lots of soup because once you boiled water, it was safe. Add leeks, add berries or nuts or grubs and slugs, anything from the wild, and simmer it into a thin liquid stretched out among too many people. Not enough calories to get fat. Yet here was a fat man, hurting him. The other one had dead eyes. Jake stared at him once, until the pain began. The man might as well have been made of stone. He moaned as the door hissed open, but only the lick came in. The alien came and stood at the head of the table and put his three-fingered claw on the strap holding Jake's arm down. Tongue flickering to taste the air, he undid the strap and stepped back. Sit, the alien invited. Jake propped up on an elbow, fought back a wave of dizziness, and kept going when it passed. He made it to a full sitting position and held on to the edge of the table for support. The alien watched him, yellow eyes unblinking in the glare of the light panels. Drink. The lick pointed to a tray next to Jake. He stared at it for a moment, then snorted. It was a tea set. A simple rounded teapot, white with blue flowers on the sides, with two matching cups on saucers on the tray. I have developed an infinity for your tea, the lick explained. His claw reached out to take a delicate teacup. Jake did the same. He sniffed the weak brown liquid, then a small sip. It tasted like warm tea, bitter and sharp. It made him realize how thirsty he was, and he took a larger gulp. 
The lick held the cup without drinking, though his tongue worked overtime and the steam filtering off the top. Jake looked around the room. His view for so long had been limited to the ceiling, plain light panels that burned into his retinas even though they only emitted a soft glow. The walls were medical-grade steel and chrome that reflected nothing but soft blurry images and the ever-present light. There was a tray opposite the tea set, this one covered in the instruments that had been used to torture him. He couldn't recall all they had done, only the pain. I feel we have reached a sort of breakthrough together, the lick said through a robotic voice box around his throat and I am delighted you have chosen to work with us. Jake nodded. Anything to stop the pain. I have a mission for you, said the lick. His yellow eyes never blinked, but he studied the young man on the table all the same. This was the test. They had broken many human subjects before, but willpower was a funny thing. Once the threat of pain was gone, most humans reverted to a pattern of thinking and behavior. This one, however, had not. Perhaps it was his age. A pliancy in the prefrontal cortex that allowed for post-hypnotic suggestion reinforced through pain techniques. The lick commander held these thoughts in check as he watched Jake, even as he reminded himself to order more test subjects in this age range. Where one could work, a dozen would do so much better. If you choose to accept it, he asked Jake. Jake finished the tea and set the glass back on the tray. This was the part the lick commander thought. They go for the knife on the tray. Humans call it a scalp and lunge for him. One last desperate effort at revenge or the hope for escape. Jake reached for the teapot and poured himself another cup. He drank it down as well. When do we get started? Chapter 8 The Lick Commander led Jake through a concrete hallway towards a light room at the far end. The boy walked on bare feet, the freezing ground leaching into his bones, the air thick with moisture against his shivering skin. He did not ask for clothes or a covering. It never occurred to him. The Commander did not possess a name. It was sacrificed when he assumed command of the conquering of this planet. He was the supreme leader for this planetary invasion, one of thousands of commanders in the solar system. The rest were on the red planet, waiting for his success. To say Earth was a prize assignment made his tongue flicker in amusement. He was here as a punishment for failing his last assignment. He didn't even know what the planet possessed that his eminence wanted, only that he was ordered here when a scout ship went missing and his orders were seek and destroy. His early success has met with his accolades, but the last year those had disappeared. The humans had mounted a defense, using tactics he was unfamiliar with. He led Jake into a palatial hangar turned war room. There was an electric heating pod in the center of the room, turning the temperature to a toasty 85 degrees. Uncomfortable to humans, but Lick Commander found it helped him move easier. A Lick soldier sat in a human chair by the pod, his back to the heat. His face was a misshapen lump of flesh over bone, covered in rips, scratches, and welts. His arms were wrapped in bandages, as were his legs, all soaked with the purple-blacked ichor Lick's had for blood. He couldn't stand. Lick Commander knew it. The bones in his legs were shattered by human bullets, but the soldier struggled to make the effort, and the commander appreciated it. Stay, he hissed, then reverted to human speech through the translator box. He was the only survivor of a patrol, the lit commander told Jake. I have had a report of his story, but wanted to hear it for myself before I made a decision. I would like for you to hear it also. Jake stood with a stoic face staring at the soldier. He felt no enmity, no empathy. He felt nothing. There were just facts. The soldier was an alien. He was injured. The commander wanted him to know how. He nodded. Proceed, 
the commander ordered. We were taken prisoner, the lick hissed through a voice box that matched the one the commander wore. They don't take prisoners. But we were, the soldier answered. They killed three of our number and tied up the rest. The lick commander glanced at Jake. A rebel group, he explained. They have been troublesome. He turned back to the injured soldier. Continue. Chapter 9 Have you heard about the babe? Lieutenant William Bonney bent a dirt and grime-covered face over the lick trussed up on the dirt. Waldo, get your ass over here and help me roll this bitch over. Lieutenant didn't wait for Waldo to comply. Just grabbed one of the lick's bound arms and started pulling. Waldo rushed over to help, and together they spun him around and slid him against a tree. Do you know why they call him the babe? LT continued. The lick soldier's tongue darted in and out of his mouth, circled his lips, and tasted the air. It nodded. Will you tell us what we want to know? The slit eyes roved over the other four aliens trussed up on the ground. The alien shook its head, the tongue moving even faster now. I'm going to have the babe come over out here and introduce himself to you right now. Do you understand? It didn't move. He understands, Waldo grumbled. The LT stood up and moved away from the alien. He sat on a log and unscrewed the flask to a growler and sipped. Babe, he called. The alien could hear the babe shuffling through the leaves behind him. He didn't turn around. This is dumb, said the babe. Why don't we just shoot him? Babe, I'm going for terroristic action here. I want the damn licks to be afraid. I want them damn licks to have nightmares about us when they go to sleep at night. Do they sleep? Hell if I know. All I know is we're going to kill every damn lick we come across and make every other one of them afraid that we might find them. And you want to do that by me beating this one with a bat? Bonnie nodded and made a motion with his hand for Babe to proceed. You know this is going to hurt, right? Babe said to the lick soldier. Your shoulder bothering you? One of the men called to the Babe. I was talking to the lick, Lutz. Corporal Lutz licks nuts, jeered another as he stripped one of the dead alien bodies of its armaments and gear. All right now, keep quiet, the captain grumbled. Let's get on with it, babe. I ain't got all day. You other boys, get me my due. Babe didn't bother to warm up as Waldo, Lutz, and the rest hacked off the heads of the dead aliens. He lifted the bat off his shoulder and swung for the fences into the shoulder of the kneeling alien. The thick, alligator-like skin cracked under the impact and sent the alien sprawling. It mewled. God damn, babe. I ain't ever heard him make a sound like that. Me either, said the sergeant. He lined up for the next shot and cracked the bat across a thigh. Skin split, spilling gore into the mud and gained another mewling sound. There he goes again. Babe, check on that. That don't sound normal. Babe used the tip of the bat to roll the lick over onto its back. I'll be damned. What is it? He's got a communicator. The LT lifted himself off the log and shrugged into his rucksack. All right, boys. He's calling in reinforcements. We need to get a move on. The rest of the squad stopped what they were doing and hitched packs onto their backs, gathered the procured weapons, and disappeared into the trees. You want to leave this one? The LT shuffled down the tiny hill and stood over the injured lick. What passed for blood in them leaked out of the shattered shoulder, and its leg jutted out at an odd angle. It grumbled low in its throat as it glared up at him. Get gone, babe, he said. Babe jogged into the woods after a squad. I probably should leave you, the captain said. He slid a forty-five out of a holster and aimed it at the unbroken leg. He pulled the trigger and the joint exploded. The lick howled. This time it's wailed the more familiar scream they were used to. 
He shifted to the elbow joint and disintegrated it with the bullet. The lick tried to roll away, flinching, but the LT blasted the other arm. The echo of the bullet had barely died down when he heard the roar of a hovercraft soaring over the treetops. He spit on the crippled alien and ran under the trees as the craft slid into view and drifted down into the clearing. LT walked past the other tied-up aliens, popping each in the back of the skull with a single bullet. He felt kind of pissed he didn't have time to take their heads, but leaving one alien felt worse. The change in tactics was a strategy. One left alive to tell the others and spread the stories. More heads to roll, more nightmares to assuage. LT slipped between the trees and was lost in the shadows before the first slick boot hit the muck of the ambush scene. He wanted them to come searching and held back a hundred yards in the woods just in case they did. But they just stood on the edge of the trees and peered into the forest, tongues flickering and what he had learned meant fear. Chapter 10 We ain't supposed to be meeting like this, the LT complained. What? I couldn't bring you something hot to eat? Smiled the colonel as they shook hands. I got plenty hot to eat out here, sir. Lutz is a damn fine squirrel hunter. All I brought was MREs. You got any of the macaroni beef? Babe shifted out of his pack and set it on the ground as a seat. The colonel pointed to a crate. Help yourself to what's in there he said as he pulled the bonnie further away from his men. You didn't come all the way out here just to feed me and debrief me, did you? I wish it were that simple. We got some intelligence today that I don't like. What else is new? We winning or we losing? Depends on where you are in the country. Maybe the world. That figures. I heard there was infighting in the Middle East again. Damn Arabs got in an uproar about something and tried to push Israel into the ocean again. Idiots can't focus on the alien invasion because their history is too long. I reckon they got to clean house when we stopped buying oil from them. More than that, but that's not our problem right now. Russia is giving them hell and kicking lick ass all over Siberia. Tough fucking bastards, and the Chinese are holding their own. Then what's the intel? We don't have an organized resistance over here. We got pockets of rebellion, but there's no structure to it. You guys have been damn effective in playing a guerrilla war, but we need to take it to the next step. My boys are pretty good at one thing, Colonel. Killing aliens. I don't know that I would want to ask them to do much else. Agreed, said the older man. But if I could get them to do it in an organized military fashion... That would help. All right, then. What did you have in mind? The colonel wiped his face with one hand as he studied the lieutenant. The licks are running a supply train to a base to the north. What kind of supplies? Human supplies. They're feeding the damn sympathizers, Bonnie growled. Turncoat bastards. That's what we figure, said the colonel. You know who those supplies would help better? LT grinned. I ain't never done a train robbery before. I'm not going to lie to you, Bonnie. It won't be easy. Hell, Colonel, we had a saying when I was growing up. If it was easy, everybody be doing it. The Colonel grinned at him. Yeah, I've heard that before. Bonnie looked over his shoulder. His squad of eight were huddled around a smokeless fire, heating up foil pouches on hot stones and trading them in silence. This here is a good group. He pitched his voice lower so only the colonel could hear. But am I getting a couple more for a big op like this? The colonel shook his head. I've got truck drivers ready to offload whatever you get. If we time it right, we might have half an hour before they get reinforcements in and shut us down. Can we move a lot in a half an hour? Depends on how much you destroy, the colonel snuffed. How well guarded, how long it takes to break in. That's a whole hell of a lot of howls, Colonel. Bonnie squinted at the full bird in front of him. The man still wore the eagle on his collar. You figuring on me coming up with a how to rob the train? The Colonel nodded. 
We need those supplies, he answered. Bonnie nodded. What's my timeline? The colonel reached into his jacket and handed him a folded piece of paper. This is all we know from recon last, he said. How old? He got a shrug and answer, which made Bonnie squint even harder. Might do me some good to get fresh eyes on it. It might. You at least got a direction we can start? The colonel tapped a thick finger on the folded paper. It's about all we have confirmed. You going to stay and join us? The LT asked as he turned his back to his squad. Wish I could, said the colonel, but it sounded like a lie. He didn't wish to spend any more time out in the woods than was necessary to deliver the message. Bonnie would have bet he drew the short straw to do it, too. He snapped off a lazy salute that the colonel returned and watched as the man marched away through the woods. A couple of snake eaters detached from the trees, and Bonnie gave a low whistle in admiration. Their camouflage was superb, and he had not noticed them. He turned back to the fire and strode over. All right, you got your bellies full, he drawled. Now listen up. They got tired of us playing engine, so they want us to play cowboy for a change. He knelt by the small flame and let it warm his hands as he reviewed the mission with his men. Chapter 11 See that? I see it, Lieutenant grumbled and shimmied back from the hilltop overlooking a long rail line. The hill was covered in pine trees and afforded an easy spot to spy on the railroad line until it bent around a corner and disappeared out of sight. LT slid down the other side of the ridge on his bottom and came to a stop with his men in a small huddle. Crockett slid to a crouch next to him. All right, you head takers and heartbreakers, we got ourselves a situation on the other side of that hill. Seems like Lick got done wise to something going down and they picked the exact same spot we planned to ambush to set up an ambush of their own. He bent over and used the tip of his finger to draw on the dirt. Line goes here round a bend, and that's where the train's coming from. Lick got two positions set up, here and here, he marked with X's. I got a head count of eight. That means we're evenly matched. He squinted up at the men. Now, any of you here think that Lick ain't got more patrols in the woods? They shook their heads. If we're compromised, said Babe. Maybe we ought to wait, LT nodded. I think that's a fine idea, Babe. And if it was up to me, I'd sure take your advice. Smartest thing I heard all day. But HQ ain't smart. Not always. I think it's cause they're hungry. See, HQ got to feed a couple thousand people. Y'all might not remember this, but back before the lick came, we used to eat three times a day. Now folks inside is lucky to eat three times a week. We got a good out here. We eat every time Lutz kills a squirrel. Not so bad, is it? His stew sucks, Babe punched him in the shoulder. I don't think it's so bad, said Rook, his young face hidden under a layer of grime. Rook's right, said L.T., it's better than the alternative, and all those folks at HQ relying on us to do our job. Our job is killing licks, Lieutenant, said Babe. Well, son, looks like we're about to be open for business. I got eight licks down there waiting on you to try and take their train. I got I don't know how many more in the woods watching their buddies back, so we ain't got time to plan something new or go pick a new spot. Road cross is right there. That's where we're meeting the trucks. I don't like it, Babe muttered. Don't none of us like it, said LT. Only fun part of this gig is after, when the killing's done. But we're out here to help some folks back home, get them food, medicine, stuff they can use for the fight. Not all of them are alien killing badasses like this fine group of men right here. He got a couple of grins for that. It was enough. Now look here. We're going to split up. He bent over the dirt again and began to diagram the plan of attack. Chapter 12 We could use an extra squad, Crockett whispered out of the side of his mouth. 
Wouldn't make half as much noise as you, Rook whispered back. You two shut up, Lutz hissed. He led Suds and the other two between the trees, eyes up and searching for any sign of Lick's soldiers. They had encountered sentries and other skirmishes, and he had no reason to believe there wouldn't be three or four more aliens in the forest, acting as the first line of defense for the two nests embedded above the railroad track. Funny, though, Crockett continued. How do they know this was the spot? How do they know this was the day? Lutz shook his head. This was the day because it's the day they're running the supply train, he said. But as for the spot, I don't know. Shenanigans, Rook muttered. Shenanigans, they whispered in agreement. Now shut up, Lutz added. They proceeded under the shadows of the trees, moving at a rushed hobble to minimize noise, but still make the position the LT wanted them in at the prescribed time. Crockett froze and held up a fist. The rest stopped, guns up. He turned around and caught Lutz's wide eyes, held up three fingers and pointed at his own eyeball, then forward to the left. Three licks to their west. Lutz motioned Rook and Suds to flank right as he dropped to his stomach and crawled up to join Crockett. The other soldier joined him and they used elbows and knees to slither through the carpet of pine needles and fallen leaves to the other side of them. The licks were 50 yards away. We need a distraction, Crockett mouthed. We need a knife. Lutz wished for the lieutenant's giant bowie knife. It was good for slitting alien throats and was silent. But if he got one, the other two would get him. They had no choice but to wait. Lutz had a second to wonder if the lieutenant could pull off an attack on the other nest with his group when the shot rang out. Rook crouched on his knee and aimed at the licks. His first shot pounded through the chest of one center mass. It cratered the flesh and sent the alien reeling. He got a second shot off that went wide, his aim disrupted by the panicked licks who began returning fire. Crockett slid up and shot one of the aliens in the back of the head. Lutz finished the other one. Up, he yelled and leaped to run through the woods. They screwed up the timetable, he knew. Rook's shot would have put the two nests on alert. He could only hope that their firefight in the trees drew attention away from where the second group was sneaking up on them. The trees around him erupted in small fires and smoke as laser blasts seared the air. He ducked, dodged, but kept running and heard Crockett on the side of him, cursing as he kept up. Lutz hit the last line of trees and ducked behind a thick pine. The smoke filled the woods as small fires burned in the dry tinder. Resin popped and crackled above them. Lutz leaned around the tree and took aim. He watched as Babe, the lieutenant, and the others decimated the eight licks focused on his position. No screams, no yells, nothing to panic them, just eight shots from four men. LT scrambled into one of the nests, nothing more than a scratched out hole in the earth, and checked the lick equipment. The radio was busted from a stray bullet. They didn't get off a warning, LT called out. Lutz, Crockett, Suds, and Rook hurried from their hiding spots and joined the rest of the squad. That was some damn fine thinking. Lieutenant grinned. Them shots you fired took the focus all the way on you. I was wondering how you were going to get them to look the other way. Lutz pointed to Rook. Tell it to Rook, he said. His plan. Damn good plan, Rook. The young man beamed under the compliment. Now, boys, here comes the hard part. Lieutenant climbed out of the nest. How are we going to stop that train? Chapter 13 Trains don't stop fast, LT said. We had them running through the hills where I was growing up. Depends on their speed, but this ain't a stick-out-your-gun-and-free situation. Block the train, said Babe. Would that work? Or knock it off the tracks? Yeah, derailing is a real possibility. What if we hop the train, asked Rook. 
hopped it, Crockett snorted. It's going a hundred miles an hour. Now hold on, Crockett, said LT. The kid's got something going here. You thinking like a bunch of hobos, Rook? Yes, sir, the young man scratched his chin. I remember watching a bunch of bums do it outside my house in our town. We lived right by a bend in the tracks, and they always had to slow down to take it. How slow we talking? Not a hundred, said Rook. Thirty miles an hour. We still can't run thirty miles an hour, snorted Crockett, and we have to stop it here. He pointed to the road. LT squinted his eyes at the men and nodded. Which one of you can climb a rope? The others looked at each other, then back at him. Come on, babe. With those shoulders, you're telling me you can't climb a rope? I haven't done it, babe shrugged. Not that I can remember. Maybe. Yeah, maybe ain't gonna cut it for what I got in mind. You mess this up, we'll be picking pieces of you up off the track. All right, suds, you're with me. The rest of you, get those licks over there and line them up on the track. Train will come by and slice those heads right off for us. Save us some work. He made a slicing motion with the edge of his hand. Me and Suds are going on a little adventure. You boys get in those nests, four in one, three to the other, and line up to get the licks guarding the train. They ain't going to like it when we stop. What are you going to do, LT? Bonnie grinned like a certified madman. You boys ever heard of Tarzan? The LT led Suds further up the tracks at a fast jog. They had dropped their packs back of the nest and were running light with rifles and pistols. LT had a small pouch strapped to his waist, but that was it. That's all they would need if the plan worked. If it didn't, they would miss the train and the rest of the squad would watch it go by, then come clean the mess. How? Far? Suds gasped. Keep going, LT ordered. He was looking for a particular spot. The tracks ran between two ridges, the eastern portion almost against the tracks, while the west gradually drifted in a slope away from the escarpment. LT checked his watch and started hunting the nooks and crags as they pounded along the wooden ties. There, he pointed and stopped. The ridge was 30 feet high, with a row of trees leaning over the edge. He went to the rock and crumbled it in his fingers. This ain't going to be pretty, he told Suds. Keep your weight spread out on your toes. Don't move your hands till your feet are set. He demonstrated, doing a starfish-like move on the rock. His cheek pressed close against it. It's only a couple of stories. You just follow me up, nice and easy. The LT started climbing. Suds watched until he got 12 feet up, close to the halfway, then put his fingers in the same holds he watched the LT use and followed. Rock, dirt, and grit cascaded down onto him each time Bonnie moved, but Suds kept his mouth closed and his eyes screwed tight into slits. He moved almost by feel, toes clenched in the edge of his boots. I'm up, LT called down to him. He felt a surge of relief and reached for the next crevice. It crumbled under his fingers, and he slid down the rock face, landing hard and cracking back on his elbow. It dropped by his side, numb. You all right? Suds cradled his injured elbow, fingers tingling as the nerves raced signals to his brain. Arms busted, he called up. Damn it, LT cursed. All right, haul your ass as fast as you can back to the others. What about you? Suds called up. Well, I guess I'm going to do the damn thing now that I'm up here, said LT. Go on, get now. Suds rocked to his feet, picked up his fallen rifle, and started hobbling up the track. His arm throbbed with each step, but he guessed he was lucky that it was just that. He could have landed on his spine, broke his neck, broke a leg, something worse. At least he could move. You hear that train coming? You get off the tracks, you hear? LT yelled at his departing back. Yes, sir, Sud shouted back and hobbled a little faster. 
LT watched him leave, then put him out of his mind. The boys would have to take care of themselves while he did what needed to be done. He reached into the pouch and unfurled a two-inch climbing rope. He tested one of the leaning trees with the bottom of his boot, slamming it three, four times to see if it rocked on the soil. It held. He stretched to tie the rope in a sliding knot around the farthest branch, using his eyeball to aim the angle. It had to work. He wasn't sure if it would, but it had to. LT had just enough to wonder if Suds was going to make it back on time when he saw something glint in the far distance. He adjusted his rifle, checked his pistol was strapped in the holster, and wrapped the rope around one hand. He gripped a little higher with the other and blew out a long, slow breath between his lips. Stupid, he said out loud. Anyone else would have come up with this half-assed plan, would have shot it down like nobody's business. He pulled on the rope in a nervous twitch, testing the hold as he perched on the edge of the ridge, swinging down on a moving train. Dumb. Just dumbass. The tree with the rope shifted and pitched over the side of the ridge, his tug disrupting the roots in the soil. Son of a bitch, he had time to sigh. Then the rope on his hand yanked him off balance and dragged him to the overhang. LT had just enough time to unwrap his hand, the rope fiber burning a line across his palm before it pulled him over. He lay with his head, arm and half his chest over the edge of the rock and watched the tree crack on the tracks 30 feet below, bounce and pitch over the side so it was just on one rail. LT could hear it now, the train coming, the rails screeching as metal on metal rocked and vibrated towards the bend. It was slowing down, but 30 miles an hour made it seem fast to a man standing still. He huffed up, looked at the remaining trees, and tried to formulate a plan. Out of rope, he grunted. Then the train appeared, a big lumbering diesel, sleek front, headlight on, yellow stripes over gray paint. It roared, the noise bouncing off the rocks and reverberating across the slope beyond. It passed under him, and he could see a boxcar directly behind the engine. Stupid, he shouted above the noise and ran along the ridge to the corner and jumped. LT landed on the boxcar top near the engine. Momentum threw him off balance, and he sprawled forward, slipping over the side of the rolling square. Slick metal slid under his fingers as his legs went over first dragging the rest of him until his fingers on the burnt hand caught the edge of the roof. He clung there for a second, no time to catch his breath as the wind buffeted him and mother gravity tugged him, encouraging him to keep falling. The physics of centrifugal force yanked on his legs, holding them out from the boxcar wall. LT surged onto the roof, crashing his waist onto the edge, pinching his balls, he ignored the searing pain and kept rolling until his body was flat on the roof and he could finally breathe. No time to rest, Billy, he said to himself and grinned. Just because his men couldn't call him the kid didn't mean he couldn't in the privacy of his own time. He unstrapped his rifle, checked the safety, and hobbled up to the diesel. A compartment at the rear was raised so the engineer could see over the front of the giant motor stretching in front of him. LT ducked down to peer into the grimy window. He could make out three shapes, two aliens and one human. He had to sling his rifle again and use his arms to balance as he leaped across the five-foot divide between cars. He landed on the diesel roof, grabbed the edge, and swung onto the narrow catwalk leading to the door. Windows lined the engine compartment. He'd been seen. A lick whipped the door open and raised a blaster. LT dropped to a knee as he yanked his 45 out. The red blast seared the air over his head as he flicked the safety and sent around into the lick snout. It pitched over the side of the train. Damn, LT muttered. If the second lick was smart, he'd hold up in the compartment, use a doorway to keep Bonnie out. But alien soldiers didn't always exhibit human behavior. This one followed his buddy out. Blaster aimed lower and melted metal in front of LT's face on the catwalk with the shot. Bonnie answered with a shot of his own, 
sending this one back into the compartment in an icor splattered mess. LT tripped over the body as he fumbled into the compartment. The human engineer screamed and raised one hand, the other feeling for a pistol. LT raised his own. This here ain't a train robbery, he said, but freeze. The hand kept moving. LT lowered his aim and destroyed the man's knee. His screaming took on a different pitch as he fell back on the plastic-covered engineer's seat. LT moved up to the controls and ignored the man sobbing. How do you stop this thing? The man ignored him and kept crying, clutching his blasted kneecap. I don't have time to parlay with you, LT yelled and whacked the man's leg with the pistol. Stop this thing. The man screamed again, tears and snot streaming down his face. But he reached up to a control, pressed a button and fell back. Brakes squealed and shrieked as the wheels slid to a stop on the metal track. It took four minutes for the train to come to a complete halt, and by that time, the engine was well past the ambush site. LT reached up, took the pistol the engineer was trying to grab. If you move, I'll shoot your other knee, he warned the man and jumped over the dead lick to the catwalk. He peered down the track at the row of boxcars in front of his squad. Three of the doors rolled back on their tracks, exposing lick soldiers. Then the real fighting began. Chapter 14 There were two dozen at least, firing from the black interior of the boxcars. Lutz, Rook, and Crockett in the nest facing them, separated by 30 yards. The Licks had high ground and superior numbers. The red blast from their lasers raked the dirt around the nest, smoke from the first fight still a fog lingering over the landscape. The second nest was further back, closer to LT and the engine. Babe rocked out of the hole and charged towards the boxcars at an angle they couldn't fire on. It worked both ways. He couldn't shoot at them either. LT watched him for a moment, then figured out what he was doing. Another distraction. Bonnie grabbed the narrow metal ladder leading to the roof of the boxcar and rocketed it up as fast as he could. He pounded along the top of the cars on the metal grid bolted in place in the center. Babe would get there first, he thought as he ran. He hoped his sergeant could hold out that long. Babe came in range and plopped on his belly, presenting a smaller profile. Then he aimed into the darkness of the boxcar and waited for a red blast to illuminate his target. One second later, he pulled the trigger and sent a shot into the lick that fired. Three seconds after that, he got another. Then he had his position. A blast exploded the dirt in front of him. Rook popped up and sprayed into the boxcar. His jack-in-the-box worked bringing the blast back to him, a lick in the second boxcar aimed and fired. The laser ripped through Rook and launched him backwards out of the nest. LT heard Lutz scream his name. Then he dropped to the edge of the boxcar, leaned down and sent three shots into the rest of the lick soldiers hiding in the dark. Babe jumped up and ran for the second boxcar, facing the same problem he had with the first. The angle was wrong. The licks in the second and third car saw a human down and concentrated their fire on the nest. Lutz and Crockett were pinned down. Waldo, Danish, and Leroy ran up to join Babe. They reached the field of fire, spread out, and started firing into the boxcar until they drew return fire. LT skipped past the second boxcar and jumped to the third. He dropped over the edge, peered over. A lick soldier was waiting. It aimed at his head. Then its snout exploded as Suds ran up screaming, shooting. LT sent shots into the interior before they could fire back at Suds. He jumped up to run back and help, but silence descended over the battlefield. Babe and the others had taken care of the second boxcar. Bonnie climbed down from the roof. Waldo, Babe, Leroy, check inside, he yelled. Suds cradled his rifle as he looked into the third car, eyes wide in pain and adrenaline. Clear, he called out. LT ran over to Lutz and Crockett where they knelt over Rook. It's bad, Lutz said in a fast high voice. 
Just keep calm, all right. LT kept his voice low and even. That was some damn fine shooting, Rook. You saved my life. I did? Rook whispered. Damn right you did, and I fucking appreciate it. No bones about it. You saved us all. He glared at the smoking wound through the middle of the boy. The flesh was sealed in some spots, cooked in others. A mishmash of meat and organs that were never supposed to see the light of day lay exposed in the red open wound. Y'all stay with him, LT grunted. Babe? Babe stood by the second box car. Lieutenant? He jogged over to Babe, checking on Leroy and Suds. What we got? Prisoners, said Babe. We don't take prisoners, LT reminded him. Babe shook his head. Not us. He tilted his chin towards the car. Them. LT stuck his head inside the car for a look. Three people huddled at the far end of the open space, backs pressed tight against a stack of canned goods. Son of a bitch. He had never heard of licks taking prisoners, nor had they encountered being transported before. Y'all must be some important some bitches, huh? He called out to them. They didn't answer, just watched him. Fog of battle, he told Babe. Get him out of here, then check on Suds. Bust up his arm before we jump the train. Babe nodded and pulled himself up into the box car to round up the survivors. LT ran up to Leroy. Supplies, sir, the man reported, just like we were told. Good man. LT locked eyes with him and Danish. Check the rest of the cars and clear a path. We can reach these first four when the supply trucks show up. Yes, sir, they answered. We're on a clock, he reminded them. Babe herded the three survivors out into the sunlight. LT watched them squint for a few minutes, then went over to find out who they were. Chapter 15 Who the hell are you? LT glared at the trio as Babe led them towards the rest of the squad. The older man in the group blinked behind large glasses. Their clothes weren't new, but they weren't worn like most survivors. LT thought they all looked soft, like good easy living and not the hard, scrabble existence most people had now. Most people in America, he reminded himself, he wasn't cocky enough to think any other part of the world was just like this. He supposed it was, but he also knew there would be collaborators. Small army of people doing what they could to survive, even if it meant betraying their own species, dooming the rest to die just so they could live a few years longer. He wondered if these people were like that. Dr. Gary Weber, the man with glasses held out his hand. LT just looked at it, and he drew it back after a moment. Why were you a prisoner of the lick, Doc? I don't know, he stammered. I don't remember. What about you? LT turned to the younger man in the group. He had a shock of black hair that fell around his tired eyes, and he looked like he was waking from a long sleep. LT could see marks on his arms, scars and burns all the way up to under the short-sleeved t-shirt he wore with simple hospital scrubs. He was barefoot. The man shrugged. You got a name? There was no response, just the tired eyes watching him. Did he talk inside? LT asked Weber. We didn't, the doc answered. None of us. You a mute too? He turned to the only girl in the group. She looked to be about the same age as the young man. Same tired eyes, but her skin was unmarked. Her hair was growing back after being shaved, and she chewed her lip in nervous anticipation. She shook her head. What's your name? Steph, she said in a voice that sounded like it hadn't been used in a while. You talk to this one inside, Steph? LT motioned to the man. She shook her head again. Why were you in there? Another shrug. She didn't know either, or wasn't saying. Jake, the man said, my name is Jake. The sudden outburst made the girl and Doc flinch. Babe hefted his bat. Jake, huh? Jake, the man sounded surprised, 
like he just pulled out of a memory and was pleased at finding it. Says his name is Jake, LT told Babe. I heard. Babe watched Lutz and Crockett as they approached. LT checked on the other man in his squad and glanced at his watch. I got a man hurt. I'm not that kind of doctor. Then what the fuck kind of doctor are you then? Dr. Weber adjusted his broken glasses. I do research. Research, LT scoffed. Like a college doctor? A petty? Petty, Weber stammered. PhD, LT sighed. Weber nodded. The broken glasses wobbled on the end of his crooked nose. It had been broken recently and healed into a knobby lump on his smooth face. Exactly, he answered. Any of you other guys got college under your belt? He asked the squad gathered around Rook on the ground. They shook their heads. See, Doc, looks like you got the most egg in your head of the lot of us. So I don't give a shit what kind of PhD you are. Get your ass over there and try to help my man who got shot saving your life. Weber gulped, but he pushed off and walked through the squad to kneel beside Rook. His wide eyes studied the mess in front of him. Smoke drifted off the scorched fabric and burned skin as breath gasped in and out of the boy. LT eyed Steph and Jake where they sat on the ground with his crossed legs. All right, Chief, what's your story? Jake glared at him. Once upon a time, Jake snorted. LT kicked a rooster tail of dirt at Jake with the tip of his boot. Son, I got a man dying over there, and I still got to get me a whole mess of lickheads to saw off before more show up. So I don't really have time to measure whose dick is bigger. You copy? Enough time to make that speech, though, said Jake. LT grunted. Then he turned to the squad. Crockett? Sir? The young man dragged himself away from his injured companion. Shoot that son of a bitch. Jake jumped, startled. Steph whimpered. But sir, said Crockett, he's human. So? So? I didn't sign on to kill people. There's not enough of us left. LT grunted again. Then go get my fucking heads. He dismissed Crockett. Lutz, get over here and shoot him. Can't, sir. Why the fuck not? Rook's dead. Lutz growled and rocked back on his heels. Doc pushed away from the body and looked around for a place to wipe his hands. There was nothing I could do, he pleaded. You're not very good at doctoring, are you, Doc? Not that kind, no, Doc Weber shook his head. Well, I sure do like a fellow who can admit his shortcomings. You boys get Rook's body ready. We're going to send him back with the supply trucks. What about them? Bay pointed his bat at Jake and the girl. LT glared at Jake, then shifted his look over to Doc. All of them are coming with us. You sure? I said it, didn't I? We ain't sending them back to HQ till I figure out what they're all about. Or shoot them. Lutz and Suds stripped what they could from Rook's gear, then wrapped his body in the scorched remains of his field jacket. Hold on, LT called out. Bring him over here, babe. Babe nudged Jake over to him with the tip of his bat. Put his feet up there, LT ordered. You can't take his boots, Lutz protested. He ain't going to need them, LT spat. And this boy can't run around in his bare feet where we're going. Unless you want to papoose him on your rucksack. I'm not going to carry him, Lutz answered. Don't look at me, said Babe. Crockett, Danish, and the others chimed in with a chorus of, Not it's. LT shifted his glare to Doc again. What about it, Doc? You want to piggyback Shoeless Joe here? Doc shook his mane of thin, stringy hair. I can't carry a tune, let alone him. Then it's settled, said the LT. Shuck them boots and finish up your prayers. The supply trucks are coming. With that, he turned and marched to the edge of the road to meet the oncoming getaway trucks. Chapter 16 
Lieutenant watched the supply trucks rumble away up the road. He figured they still had 10 minutes before a hovercraft showed up. There had been a small debate on what to do with the engineer. He can go with you, the supply sergeant argued. Now normally I would agree that was the right call, LT drawled, but allowances have to be made. I shot out the man's kneecap. That's going to make it difficult for him to keep pace up with my squad. Not my problem, the sergeant said without looking. Orders. We don't bring nothing back but supplies. Now you're starting to piss me off, Red, LT growled. If I was to say my men are getting on that truck, who's going to stop it? The sergeant looked up from the boxes being stacked in the back of a moving truck. My name isn't Red, he said in a snotty voice. The engineer who had been trundled off the diesel was laying on the edge of the road. He watched the exchange and reached inside his coat pocket. LT put his hand on his weapon, giving earnest consideration to shooting the sergeant and wondering how much trouble he would be in. The engineer pulled out a tiny snub-nosed thirty-eight, put the end in his mouth, and squeezed the trigger. Well, damn, said Lieutenant. Guess that settles that. Settles what? The sergeant looked up from the dead body. If I was going to shoot you or not. He left the man to ponder his fate and went over to Babe and the rest of his squad. Babe, get Suds and Rook squared away, will you? Me and that fella don't get along too well. Yes, sir. Babe gave a half salute and went to take care of it. LT stared at the three former prisoners, his eyes dancing over each of them. Doc offered a smile, Steph wouldn't meet his gaze, and Jake just stared back. What are we thinking, LT? asked Lutz. I'm thinking we need to get the hell away from here first. Lick's going to be all up on us any minute. Lutz nodded and gathered the three former prisoners as Crockett, Waldo, and Leroy formed a loose perimeter around them. Danish, LT called out. Sir, get up front and find us a path out of here. He jogged ten yards ahead of the group as the others fell in behind him. They didn't wait for Babe, who finished with the supply trucks and ran to catch up. Weber watched Leroy out of the corner of his eye as they moved through the trees. He called you Leroy. Is that your name? Leroy shared a wide grin on his dark face. Not my real one, but mine all the same. He kept his eyes moving over the trees, searching for threats. LT calls us whatever he wants. And you answer? Like we got a choice, Waldo said from behind him. What does it matter what he calls us anyway? One name's as good as the next out here. As long as we don't get mixed up, said Leroy. Not much chance of that. Doc Weber pondered this for a few moments as he stomped through the leaves. A rose by any other name, he finally said. Though I think names are important, it is a way to help us maintain our identity through this crisis. That the name you call this invasion, Doc? A crisis? LT called from the rear where Babe had joined him. Weber almost tripped as he tried to look over his shoulder and walk at the same time. What would you refer to it as? Crisis is as good as word as any, shrugged LT. War is how I think of it. War, Doc pondered. I think we may be in a war of eradication, an extinction crisis unlike any the world has ever seen. I don't know about that, said LT. I think I read me somewhere we've had about five or six extinction events so far. Excuse me, extinction crisis. What's that? Babe said in a low voice. Like when the asteroid hit and killed all of the dinosaurs, LT answered. They didn't prove that happened, said Lutz. It's an accepted theory, is all I'm saying. Theory, sure, sir, Lutz called back to him but there are a couple about the size of dinosaurs and overpopulation leading to starvation and the spread of disease, too. See, Doc? LT laughed. Got us a little book learning, and we can have intellectual conversations all damn day. Not a lick of college between us. Your rank denotes college, said Jake. Well, look here. Who decided to join the conversation? LT hooted. Guess my threat of having you shot ain't enough to keep your mouth shut. 
You want me to be quiet? Don't ask any questions, Jake shot back. That's called the Socratic method, boy. Ask a ton of questions to get the answers you want to hear. Of course, the police used to trip up people and catch them in lies when there was up to no good. Guess I need you to figure out if I'm trying to get the right answers out of you or trying to find out what you're lying about. I haven't said anything. Jake almost tripped over a root. And Chief, that's telling me a whole hell of a lot. Steph nudged Jake with her elbow and he took a deep breath. The entire group walked in silence for the next half mile. Rook, said Weber, the one who was shot? Was that his name or a nickname you gave him? LT didn't answer. He liked to play chess, said Babe, but we didn't have a chess set. Who has a chess set anymore? He started to carve one, but we only made one piece before he stopped. A castle. Weber stopped and leaned his hand against a tree. Forgive me, he worked to catch his breath. I'm not used to walking so much. The soldiers formed a soft perimeter facing out to watch the trees while LT and Babe flanked the trio of civilians. Didn't get much exercise before, huh? LT eyed them. Where was that exactly? I don't know, Doc answered. You don't know where you were? A prison of some sort. I suppose that's what it must have been. Where were you going? Asked Babe. Excuse me? I think what Babe is trying to get at is why the three of you were on that train. The only humans beside the one who shot his own head off. Jake and Steph exchanged a glance and shrugged. Y'all are going to have to stop that, LT protested, because that don't make you look guilty at all. Guilty of what? Jake asked. Looking? Like you got a secret. You want to share anything with me? Jake shook his head. I don't have a secret. Sure you do. No, I really don't. I'm telling you, Chief, you got a couple of them. Secret where you came from. Secret where you were headed. Secret why you and the Nina there keep making goo-goo eyes at each other. Secret what you know about the doc. Hell, that's five good ones right there. It's not a secret if you don't know the answers to them. LT and Jake locked eyes and stared at each other, neither blinking. The LT squinted, his hard look trying to pierce whatever was going on in Jake's mind. What do you know about the licks? LT asked, and Jake looked away. His face turned into a grimace, teeth gritted tight as his lip curled in disgust. Not enough, he grumbled. Too much. That's enigmatic, said Babe. You're ready to get moving, Doc, LT asked. We stay much longer, and I'll start thinking you're delaying us on purpose. Don't take my lack of stamina for anything but a condition due to confinement, Weber said, and pushed off the tree as the group resumed their march through the woods. Chapter 17 The Lick Commander lounged on the chase and tried to find a comfortable position. After decades in space, he still wasn't used to Earth's gravity. The constant weight and pull on his muscles made his bones sore and that there was only one way he could find relief. Hot tubs. But they were impractical, and so he saved them for the conclusion of daily matters. He missed space. Missed the feeling of flying. The only thing he enjoyed about this exile to this backwater planet was the entertainment. He used the tip of his claw to control a monitor on the wall playing what was called a television program. A story about a ragtag fleet of human survivors attacked in their home system and fleeing to another, hunted by the androids they created. Commander, a soldier entered his private chamber. Lick Commander hissed at the interruption the impertinence of common foot soldier bursting into his room unannounced. This would not happen with any of the others on his same level. No, they commanded a respect among the troops. He, on the other claw, did not. Speak, he ordered. The human raiders have assaulted the train. The lick commander hissed his pleasure, his momentary anger supplanted by a feeling of accomplishment. 
His work to pacify the human resistance had several setbacks of late, but this new plan would satisfy his eminence that the choice for him to lead here on earth was the right one. And he awaited the rest of the report. It has gone as you predicted. The soldier bowed his head, a small measure of respect in his yellow eyes. Lick Commander flicked his tongue into the air, tasting the scent of a victory. This plan still had a way to go before it would be complete, but if it worked, then he would be rewarded. Failure meant nothing to him. There were only a few who knew of the plan, and if it failed, he could rid himself of them. That is all? he asked the soldier still standing there. Eminence command awaits you, the soldier said. It wasn't respect in his eyes then, thought the commander. It was another form of impertinence. He watched the underling's tongue flicker out to taste for fear from his leader. He wouldn't give the soldier the satisfaction. He touched a control screen on a tablet inset in the chase lounge. A hasty addition, but necessary. His first claw tapped on the screen, and a holograph image of his eminence glowed on the floor between the soldier and commander. The soldier dropped to one knee and bowed his head, as was proper for his station. Lick Commander was only required to bow, and he did so, but not before catching a glimpse of several of his peers in the same chamber with his lord and master. Sir, he hissed in greeting, I hear rumblings from earth. His eminence used the human name for the planet. My will does not progress. These are rumors. Lick Commander didn't raise his head, even though he wanted to glare at the men surrounding his leader. They were the ones spreading the lies, or half-truths couched to highlight his failures and ignore any success he might have had. Your will is being enacted, sir. He could feel the burning eyes of his eminence burning in the back of his head, the yellow slits unblinking and intimidating, even as a glowing band of energy. See that it is, the leader hissed, menace in the static lace transmission. I am tempted to send my nestmate to oversee my will. Lick Commander bowed lower. A nestmate would act as the eyes and ears of his eminence, but not necessarily disrupt his plans. Besides, he calculated, a nestmate would make a powerful ally. By your command, he hissed and looked up. Of course, the joke of it would be lost on his eminence, but the meaning would translate. He saw a spark of satisfaction in the hologram's eyes, an acknowledgement of his allegiance. The Lick leader lifted his clawed hand and motioned for the connection to be cut. Lick commander turned to the soldier. Prepare for an arrival, he said to the soldier. She has already arrived, the commoner informed him. Lick commander drew the blaster from his holster and seared a hole through the subordinate's thick skull, spraying black gore across the chrome walls of his private study. You should have informed me sooner. He folded himself off the chase and went to greet his new arrival, the nestmate sent to spy on him. Chapter 18 Bonnie stared at the back of the trio's head as they walked. It would be dark soon, and he was wondering how they were going to do what needed to be done with the extra people around, especially people he didn't know. Lieutenant, Babe said in a soft voice next to him, what are you planning to do with them? You know what I like, Babe? I like the fact that we've been working together so much you are practically reading my mind. Not really, shrugged the big man. I saw you staring at the back of their heads and figured that was what you were thinking about. Now you're just plain hurting my feelings, LT said. I figured I had a pretty good poker face, but now you're telling me I better not play any hands with you. You can read me like a book. Babe smiled and rested the bat on his shoulder. He carried his rifle on a short sling across his chest, hand on the grip with the other. LT made sure all his boys were ready to fight in an instant. The bat was gripped in the other, the wood dented, chipped in some spots, and stained with black blood. Thing is, the LT continued, 
I figure we could just keep on raiding, like we've been doing, but that seems like it's a short-term solution to a long-term problem. Command was saying they wanted some sort of organized resistance set up. What's our role in that? LT shook his head as they walked. I'll be damned if I could tell you, babe. We're pretty good at one thing. Killing fucking licks. If they need more killing done, well, I guess they are out to send us in. We done a fair bit of good at it so far. But if they want emissaries delivering messages between fighting groups, I don't think we're going to make that good a Pony Express. Babe thought about this as they kept walking through the woods. He hadn't grown up in the country, not like the LT who sounded like his parents put gravy in his bottle. He was a city boy, born and bred on the south side of Chicago. He was on a car ride to Memphis when the aliens invaded and never made it back home. Not that there was much home to go to. The Licks pretty much destroyed the coast and every major city in between. Smaller towns escaped the wrath of the invasion, but suffered infestations of their own as survivors and refugees poured into them. Then the Licks set up occupation forces, and things got really bad. I think you're selling us short, LT, he offered. How you figure? I figure we built a good reputation for doing what we do over the past six months. People hear about it, and it makes them want to fight back. You think we're inspiring folks? I think so. And if we showed up at your doorstep and said it was time to fight differently, they might listen. To you. To us, babe. I'm pretty damn good at killing licks because I fucking hate them. But you boys is a damn sight better than me. Better than I could be. Babe doubted it, but he held his tongue. He felt a small tingle of pride at the praise. But if we go Paul Revere and knock door to door to drum up the fighting, LT continued, what are we going to do with these? Babe shrugged again. Guess that's why command pays you the big buck, sir. You getting paid, babe? LT grinned. You must got a better agent than me. He blew a short, sharp whistle between his lips and pulled the squad up short. Find us a camp for the night, Danish. He ordered and sent the man ahead to scout for a clearing and water. I'm going to have to do me some hard thinking on our next step. Now, I'm open to your suggestions, but the say-so is mine. Lutz, you want to scare up some dinner? Lutz nodded. You got something to add before you run off? I'm with you, LT. I say we go west. I'm going west, young man. You say dance, we do the dance. Good man, Lutz. Now how can you argue with blind obedience like that? LT joked with the others. Would like me some other opinions, though. What are the choices, LT? Leroy asked. What to do with this here lot? He pointed to Jake, Steph, and Doc. What to do next for a mission? We can keep raiding and killing, or we can set up an organized fight. He ticked them off on two fingers, watching the trio as he did so. Should we be saying this in front of them? Crockett said. What are they going to do? Run off and tell? That's exactly what I'm afraid they'll do, Crockett answered. We don't know them. You want to shoot them then? That it? No, sir, said Crockett. Not yet. LT motioned them to follow in the direction Danish took off, picking up his trail. My nature ain't normally to trust, LT said now that they were packed closer together, but I can't just pull you away and leave the three of them all alone out here. They found Danish a few minutes later in a small opening in the trees. A large pine knocked over by a storm formed a windbreak near a shallow running creek that disappeared into the woods. It's not perfect, he said, but it will do. Each man in the squad attended to a specific duty. Leroy gathered wood and started a small, smokeless fire and put three pots of water in the coals to boil. Crockett and Danish cleared off branches and rocks to smooth out a sleeping space. Lutz came back with two squirrels already skinned and began making a thin stew from the meat and one of the pots of water. 
They refilled all the canteens and a couple of plastic water bladders once the water had been purified and cooled. They worked in silence and ate in silence under the watchful eye of Bonnie. He made sure the trio of rescue prisoners had a cup of food, then leaned against a tree as he ate his own. What are we doing out here? Doc Weber asked. LT glanced up at the darkening sky. Twilight turned the air around them a soft shade of gray. Hints of sunlight still on the horizon with purple and orange bruise colored bands. Getting ready to bed down, Doc. No, I mean your group. My squad? This here is an elite killing unit in the business of lit killing. And let me tell you, business is good. Lutz, about how many licks you figure you got under your belts? Couple hundred LT? I haven't kept count. 987, said Leroy. That many? Really? Lutz scoffed. Leroy pulled a tattered notebook from a pocket in his jacket and tapped it with his finger. He pried it open, grabbed a stub of a pencil, and added tick marks to neat rows of others on a line. I might have missed a dozen. There were a couple of times we didn't get heads because we had to run. There you go, Doc. Almost a thousand of these alien fuckers. That's a lot of dead, Steph said without looking up from her cup. Won't make a difference. It's very impressive for such a small group, Weber said, shooting her a look from the corner of his eye. Yeah, well, we had two more till today. Two Rook. Crockett tipped up his canteen. The others joined him. Hell no, snarled LT. Put your damn drinks down. Rook was a good man, and a good man deserves a proper wake. We'll toast him when we find whiskey. Not much of that left, LT, Babe said. We'll find some. I got a nose for it, and a craving now that we're talking about it. Such primitive weapons, too. Weber stared at their scarred and battered rifles. I figured it'd be a little harder with muskets, said LT, but we got one weapon they can't fight against. Human integrity? Cunning? Weber asked. Striking good looks, said Lutz. Surprise, LT answered. They don't know what we're going to do next. It has been effective, said the doc. But I overheard you saying a change of tactics is in order. LT scowled, his frown visible in the growing darkness, shadows from the fire brushing his jaw. Nobody likes an eavesdropper, doc. But seeing as how it ain't easy to not listen in, I'm going to let it slide. What if I could offer to help? Weber looked at him over the rims of his glasses. The small flames flickered in the lenses and gave his eyes the appearance of glowing. Excuse me, Doc, Crockett said, but you don't look too well trained in weapons. Weber chuckled without amusement, more of a polite noise of dismissal than mirth. And I am not he said, shoulders shaking in a self-deprecating way. But my petty, did you call it? LT nodded. Was in nanotechnology and microprocessing, the doc continued. What's that? LT asked. Miniatures, said Lutz. Microscopic robotics, doc clarified. Well, hell, doc. No wonder you ain't no good at medicine. You're a damn robot doctor. Like I said, not that kind of doctor, but part of a project I was working with before the invasion might have something that will help your cause, if it's still there. I appreciate that, Doc. All for one and one for all. Beats the shit out of every man for himself any day in my book. But, Doc nodded his head, shooting tiny reflections of light across the campsite. But what? Steph snapped. He's offering to help you. You don't seem like you're in a position to say no. LT squinted at her across the band of darkness. She glared at him, unable to see the top part of his face, just the thin line of a frown. He is skeptical, said the doc. LT nodded. May I? Doc asked. Bonnie waved his hand in an invitation. 
He is trying to determine if one or all of us is a spy. The offer I presented is vague, but full of promise. A mystery technology that could help change the course of the rebellion. He thinks it is a trap. Did I get it all? You didn't tell me about the course of the rebellion, LT said. But other than that, I'd say you're pretty fucking accurate. Shoot us and be done, Jake snarled. You said that's what you would do. And I still might, Lieutenant sighed. The thing is, a good snake oil salesman gets you all excited for the outcome, and the doc here is a damn good salesman. He got all of us wonder what kind of tech he knows about. He's tweaked our curiosity, and he knows we're wondering things. Is he telling the truth? Is he buying time for the lick to find us? Is he leading us into a trap? Which is it, LT? Bonnie shook his head. Everybody grab a sleep. I'll take first watch. Babe, you and Leroy divvy up some blankets for the new folks. Jake didn't wait for a blanket, just rolled over on his side, back to the fire. Steph grabbed a small emergency poncho and huddled under it between Doc and the young man. Lutz shifted his foot forward and covered dirt over the fire, lowering it to just embers. He watched as the LT got up and walked out of camp, soon lost among the shadows of the trees. Chapter 19 Jake glared at the trees in the darkness, a throbbing at the base of his skull. He had a headache for as long as he could remember, and listening to the doc drone on had only made it worse. The man hadn't shut up since they woke up in the boxcar together. That's what he could remember, but the others said they could remember. Waking up to the train, rocking back and forth, the clacking of the wheels on rail as it raced to wherever it was going. Jake didn't know where he had been. There were faint memories, hints of them, nothing more. A light of light, a lot of chrome, pain, but nothing else. Not even who he was. He knew he was a human, knew he had been a child, had grown into adulthood, and then aliens took over his planet. He knew these things like knowing how to breathe, or how to make his heart beat in his chest. It was instinctual, primal, but he couldn't say what his last name was, where he was from, what he had done before he woke up. Maybe he was a soldier. The guns the men in the squad carry look familiar, had a familiar feel. Or maybe he was a weapons maker too. The blank spots in his mind were his alone. The doc had plenty to say, most of it about the past and their present situation. The girl just nodded a lot. Maybe Jake had some special knowledge and the humans wiped his mind so he wouldn't fall into alien hands. He held that up to the light, twisted the thought around and examined it for a few minutes. He didn't feel special or smart or like he was a secret keeper for the human race. What he felt was tired. Tired of his head aching, tired of the looks of suspicion from the soldiers and tired of not knowing. Why were they on the train? Where were they going? He stared into the darkness and waited to see if the stars winking on above would offer an answer, but they did not. At least the dock was quiet, if Jake didn't count snoring. None of the soldiers snored. He could feel them around the clearing, the presence of their bodies blocking off natural noise and insect hume, acting as brakes but he could not hear them snoring or stirring. He envied them, envied their ability to sleep so well. They must know who they are, where they are from. He wondered about the girl, wondered about her story, and the lieutenant who had taken an instant dislike too. The man just rubbed him the wrong way, with his squinty eyes and strong jaw and unasked questions. Jake could feel them burning off the man. He sighed and rolled over, searching for a position where his head wouldn't ache. Wide eyes stared at him in the darkness. What? he whispered. Steph shrugged one shoulder, the other trapped under her body, unable to move. 
Do you remember? She asked. He glared at her, shook his head, then realized she might not be able to see it. No. You? No. He seems to remember enough for the both of us. He sniffed and settled into the ground. I don't know if I want to remember, she said in a voice so low he almost didn't hear her. He didn't answer, because he knew just how she felt. Chapter 20 Bonnie leaned against an oak tree and stared at the battered weapon in his hand. The M16 had more advanced versions since this one had been in service, but those were lost in the first round of fighting the invasion. The rest of the inventory was mopped up in laser carpet bombs that took out bases and armories. These were scavenged from battlefields, from museums, from homes. He could list off three other types of rifles in his squad, including an AK-47 and a 306 Winchester. There were rumors about other weapons out there, the stuff they sent to Mars to fight in the first place. But common wisdom held the labs and places where those weapons were kept had been destroyed. So, the dock was lying, he thought to himself. He rested the rifle against the rough bark of the tree and aimed into the clearing. LT wished he had a night scope. It was hard to make out shapes, little more than darker spots of shadow on the ground. If the moon was out, it would be easier, but that was a double-edged sword. If the moon was so bright he could see, then he could be seen. One of the shadows moved on the far side of the clearing, slipping into the trees. LT glanced at the luminous numbers on the wind-up watch he wore face on his wrist. Right on time. A second shadow disappeared three minutes later. Now he just had to wait. Nothing else moved in the clearing, the light snoring of the dock carrying several yards into the trees. He didn't wait long. LT heard the hover car come in fast and low, the roar of the wind turbines scattering leaves and small branches as it dropped over the clearing. The bottom folded up like a clam, dropping six licks down into the ground, weapons hot. LT popped two while they were still in the air, aiming at the shadow of their heads backlit by the interior of the hover jet. Babe shot one, Lutz got two more, so that only one was still alive when it landed. LT lined up and sent a round through its snout at the same time Lutz took a shot from the opposite direction. The lick head disintegrated from the top of its body, a geyser of fluid spraying across the clearing. Then Babe lobbed a Molotov cocktail into the hover jet. The pilot tried to escape, pulled back on the stick, and roared a hundred yards away before the flames spread into the cockpit and cooked it. The twitching arms on the yoke yanked the hover jet into a dive. It plowed through the forest, leaving a flaming trail away from the clearing until it exploded, showering the horizon with orange-red glowing flames. Everyone up, LT yelled as he stepped out of the trees. Babe and Lutz detached from the trees where they had set up the counter ambush and kept their weapons on the three people on the ground. The soldiers were on their feet. Jake was too. Steph and Doc were slower, confusion causing them to move with arrested steps as if they were still dreaming. Lutz, get us a path through them woods. Lutz took off on a double trot. The rest fell in behind him, Babe corralling the three stumbling ex-prisoners in behind Danish. LT brought up the rear, guns still up and ready. It would be nice if they had better weapons, he thought, but damned if they didn't make good do with what they had. Chapter 21 He called for the rest five miles later. His watch told him it was 2 a.m. and they were wiped. His squad had been up and at it since four the day before, and two fights had left them tired as the adrenaline worked out of their system. How did you know? He heard Jake ask. LT could feel him staring at him, feel them all looking at him. Pray for daylight, Chief. What happens at daylight? The young man asked in the dark. Then we can see what you're up to, LT answered in a steely voice. 
The squad surrounded the trio. Jake could hear them trump to points around them and settle onto the ground, even if he couldn't see them. Watching us, he thought. He stared at the dark mound next to him, seated on the ground, her back to him, and the dock next to her. No one said anything, and after a few moments, he could hear the steady breathing of the dock, head slumped on his concave chest. But the soldiers didn't snore, didn't move. At last, the sky to the east turned a shade of purple as violet-infused light gave everything a gray cast. Jake couldn't make out the faces of the men watching him, watching the others. Not at first. Then the shadows dissolved as sunlight crept across the clearing. When it reached the toes of his burrowed boots, LT stood up and whistled. The rest of the squad jumped to their feet, and as one, they advanced on the three figures in a tight circle. Up, LT commanded in a soft voice. Jake stood, Steph nodged the dock, startled him awake, and they both stood on creaking, shaking legs. Strip. Excuse me? Steph huffed. Your clothes. All of them. Take them off. She crossed her arms across her chest, wrapping her hands tight. I will not, she fumed. Look, lady, LT snarled. I know what you're thinking. Six of us out here, strapping young men, and you're the only woman around. You're afraid we're going to take our way with you. But I'm here to tell you, that ain't going to happen. He squinted at Babe and Lutz. Is it, boys? No, sir, said Babe. I don't even like girls, Lutz muttered. Babe shot him a look and shrugged. So, see, one of you is bugged. That's the only explanation I can find. And when I find out who it is, LT glared at Doc, I think that's going to go a long way to solve my trust issues. Doc shrugged his shoulders and began to unbutton the frayed jacket he wore. He dropped it to the dirt, followed by his shirt, t-shirt, and pants. He stood shivering in a pair of tight white briefs gone gray through use and lack of washing. All of it, Doc, said LT. He made a notion with his head, and Crockett grabbed the clothes and began turning the pockets out. Next, LT invited while Crockett continued the search. Steph gave him a woeful look, eyes full of fear, as she took off her jacket with ginger motions. Her shirt followed, then her pants until she was standing next to the dock in her bra and panties. She glanced over at him, and he gave an encouraging nod, and together they stripped to their bare skin. Leroy gave a huff of appreciation. Shut it, LT commanded. Turn around. He made a spinning motion with one finger up in the air. Lutz and Bay leaning in to examine them as they did. Danish grabbed her fallen clothes and knelt next to Crockett to go through them. Satisfied? Steph sneered. Babe? I don't see any marks, the big man answered. Nothing under the skin. I think we would know if we were marred with a tracking device, said the doc. Yeah, but you most likely wouldn't tell us, now would you? Especially if you were collaborating, said LT. When they're finished, you can put your clothes back on. He turned to Jake. Now you, chief. Jake dropped his pants first. He was bare underneath. No shoes, no drawers, LT said in a low voice. What do they do with you? I wish I knew, answered Jake as he shucked his jacket and shirt. He spun around without waiting to be ordered, slow so they could examine him too. Clear, announced Lutz. LT stood back while they bent to examine his clothes. Here, said Babe and held up the shirt. A tiny device shaped like a grain of rice was sealed into the hem of the ratty t-shirt. LT held it up and examined it. Did you know about this? He asked, but he didn't expect an answer. About it? Jake snarled as he stared at it. I don't know what it is. Fascinating, said Doc as he finished dressing and stepped forward. May I? LT twisted it back and forth in the growing sunlight, then dropped it into Doc's outstretched palm. RFID, 
he said as he studied it. Radio frequency identification tag. Things no bigger than a tick, said LT. They could have put that in your skin. Crockett and Danish stared at the tiny little device, hard to see in Weber's hand. I wasn't feeling for anything that small, Lieutenant, Crockett finished. LT waved them forward, and they examined the clothes again, this time while the girl and older man were wearing them. Can I get dressed now? Jake asked, forgotten off to one side. He didn't wait for an answer, but slid into his jeans and stood on one foot to put his boot before switching legs for the other. He shivered as goose pimples popped out on his bare flesh. Babe used his rifle to fish up the jacket and pass it back to him. We were using these in shipping before the aliens arrived, Doc mused. Looks like they repurposed it. Smart, said Lieutenant as he scanned the skies. He held out his hand. Doc clenched his fist around it. Are you going to destroy it? Hell yeah, I'm going to destroy the damn thing. It'll lead the lick right to us. But, Doc licked his lips and took a deep breath. What if it led the lick away from us instead? LT pursed his lips and squinted at the man. How far do you think that stream goes? Doc took Bonnie's silence for an invitation to continue. We could stick the tracker to a branch and send it downstream. The aliens would chase it instead of us. Lutz nodded. Makes sense, Lieutenant. I know it does, LT snorted. I'm just wondering, that's all. Wondering what? Lutz asked. If this is a feint to get our trust and set us up for something bigger later. If you don't trust us, said Jake, you could just turn us loose. Steph perked up at that idea, but the doc just watched while he waited for an answer. Can't turn you loose yet, said Lieutenant after a moment of thought. That's just as good as shooting you out here. But the more I think on your idea, the more I like it. Let's get it done. Doc didn't move fast enough for his taste, though. Come on, Doc, he barked. Licks could be chasing it down right now. Mad as hell we knocked their last ship out of the sky with a bottle of gas. And I'm out of gas, said Babe. The dock forged for the right-sized branch, with the split in the end deep enough to lodge the RFID, then tossed it into the narrow stream. The squad and their three guests watched it spin and twist until it disappeared. Once it was gone, Danish took point and led them away from the clearing, away from the stream. LT brought up the rear, watching the three as they marched. Sooner or later, he was going to have to decide what to do with them. Chapter 22 The Lick Commander stared at the radar display and watched a small dot move across a holographic image. The dot blinked in red, then disappeared from the topographic map that stretched from the floor to waist high in the middle of the chamber. His tongue darted out, flickered and disappeared back into his snout. So, you see? He hissed. He reached up and flicked off the human translator box he wore on a collar around his throat at a flicker of annoyance. The nest mate had landed and demanded to see his progress. He showed her to the chamber where they watched video of the attack and the subsequent offloading of supplies. You do not think to put tracking devices in the supplies? She hissed at him. He bowed his head. His silence was answer enough. An oversight. She forgave him and caused him to look up with his yellow eyes wide. His eminence was not known for forgiveness, nor was his reluctant to punish even the most minor mistake. The utterance of his nest mate was tantamount to treason. She stared at him as if daring him to contradict her, or worse, report her on the intergalactic communicator. He did neither. I assume the one would do, he said, but our craft was delayed in takeoff. He had heard the term human error within the first six months of establishing the beachhead on Earth and assumed it meant the slaves they kept to do work on their base. 
He tried to make suitable examples of any miscreants to the few workers remaining, but so far his efforts had not yielded the desired results. The human infestation, she flickered her tongue out in disgust. Lick Commander nodded. Then remove them from the base, she suggested, even though it sounded more like an order. They have their uses, he started to protest. Find more, she said. Others. Are their young not more pliant? That's why they send them to battle us on Mars, is it not? He nodded again, the neurons in his brain firing like a laser battery as he tried to determine her reasons for assisting, her reasons for mercy. The suggestion makes sense, he told her. It was her turn to nod. The nestmate wouldn't take her eyes off him, but far from making him uncomfortable, he found her look to be invigorating. He could say nothing, nor could he act on it, for a quick blast to the head wouldn't be far behind, but he relished the way she stared at him. A lick soldier bowed and scrapped into the room, eyes locked on the commander and a sigh of obedience and respect in front of the nestmate. The example he had made of his fellow must have reached the ears of the commoners. Lick Commander held in a snort of derision. The soldier had paid for his impertinence and lack of respect. The craft approaches the signal, the soldier informed them. And so, they watched as the craft disappeared from radar. The nestmate snorted long and low. Does that mean it is destroyed? Lick Commander made an instinct noise in his throat. Yes he answered. Are they often able to destroy our battlecraft? Not the humans left, he said. And yet they did. Yet they did, he agreed. He feared to meet her gaze, wondered now how she would be looking at him. But when he could no longer stare at the floating holograph, he looked over at her to find her staring still. An interesting challenge, do you not think, she hissed. He tilted his head. No repercussion. No blame. Just a question that seared into him. I do enjoy an interesting challenge. Her eyes sparked. Perhaps you will allow my advice and assistance. He nodded, for there was no other answer when a member of the royal house made a request. But in the back of his mind, he wondered at the outcome. Humans called it luck and the Lick Commander felt very lucky to be alive, and luckier still to have found an ally. Chapter 23 Danish led the squad through the trees. He wasn't sure where they were going, just a direction that took them away from the ambush site and the stream where they sent the tracking device. His eyes flicked through the treetops, always on the hunt for squirrels, or something else they could turn into dinner. He had a standing bet with Lutz on catching one first. He thought Point should be able to see them, but so far, Lutz was the best provider they had. He was the best pathfinder, though. He shrugged the strap on his pack. Even as light as it was, they still ate into his shoulders, leaving a permanent ache. What he wanted more than a squirrel for dinner was a massage. He wondered if the girl prisoner would give him one. She's not a prisoner, he reminded himself, then spent the next hundred yards wondering what exactly she was, who they were, and where they were going. LT nodded in general direction, and so far, hadn't called a halt or shift yet. Maybe it meant he had something in mind. Maybe it just meant he didn't know. Danis wasn't sure either way. Leroy stepped closer behind him. Did you see her? he whispered in the back of Danish's head. I saw. What do you think? I think you better keep your eyes off of her, Danish whispered back. You can't call dibs, Leroy argued. You heard LT. We're not touching her. Man, that's only if she doesn't want to be touched. If she liked you, I bet you ignored LT. Danish shook his head. No way, he said. But that was one more thing to wonder about. Not that she gave any of them a second look, and the circumstances sure weren't right, not for any kind of romance to blossom. 
He could wonder, though, and dream. It seemed like Leroy was already thinking about those lines. Where is he taking us? Dana shrugged. The man pointed, he said. We go. Thinks he sniffed out some licks? The man seemed to have a nose for where they gathered, for where they patrolled. Probably. He also was the only one with any real military training. Danish, Leroy, and the rest of them had come up in the ranks after the invasion. LT was a soldier before they showed up, though he never said much about it. None of them did. Better not to talk about the before. Just focus on cleaning up the now and get ready for the after. I heard him with the colonel, you know. What did he say? They want us to start organizing. What do you think? Leroy chewed on the corner of his lip for a minute. Seems like a waste of our talent. What do you think? Dana shrugged. I think if LT wanted to get a big group together, they'd follow him to the end of the earth. Maybe that's what I'm afraid of, Leroy said softly. If a big group of us did get together, it's the end of the earth as we know it. Hard to get all of us divided up like we are. Danish pondered that as they walked in silence for a few moments. That's what they did on the coast. Got us in numbers. That's why we don't do big anymore, Leroy said. Maybe that's why now is the right time to start again, Danish offered. Because they don't expect it. Maybe, Leroy grunted. It doesn't matter, though. I'm going to do whatever LT tells me to do. Me too. Unless that girl wants to get to know me better. That sort of thing isn't up to him, Danish snickered. Brother, I think you might have to get in line. He nodded. Leroy looked over and saw Steph watching Jake as they marched through the trees. Yeah, but he don't look like he wants to be in line, Leroy smiled back. Chapter 24 LT called a halt a half hour later. They were miles from the stream, far enough he figured that they were safe for the moment. He heard Jake's stomach rumble and stared at their guest. His squad was tough, used to lean eating and hard moving, but not these three. Doc massaged his calves while Jake stared at the ground with a sullen look on his face. Steph stared back at him, her face a blank slate of emotion, but her eyes looked tired. He sat down in front of them. We ain't eating until later, he told them. This here is a parlay for what's about to happen next. Jake glanced up, caught LT's eye, and looked back down again. Now this one says he don't remember nothing. Can't. He pointed at Jake with a long finger. This one says he remembers a lot. And you, well, I'm still trying to figure you out. He stared at Steph for a minute. What were you doing on the train? She shrugged. You got a memory? She huffed and nodded. Well, go on then. Tell us what you remember. I was a prisoner, and then I wasn't. Where? She shrugged again. I don't know. How did you get to be a prisoner? She shook her head. I just was. For as long as I can remember, they used us to maintain their bases. LT rubbed his nose with the back of his hand. You know the layout of the bases? A base, he looked at Doc. The same one you were on? And you? I can speculate, Doc answered. They put us on the train at the same time. He was unconscious. That don't answer the question I asked, Doc. Were you on the same base as her? He looked at her out of the corner of his eye. I think so. Think don't cut it where I come from. A man can think a lot, but that don't make it so. Lutz, Babe, and the rest of the squad spread out to form a loose perimeter, but still close enough to hear. It's different in there, Steph spoke in a hushed tone. You don't look up, you don't make noise, you don't do anything. Just do what you're told. LT glanced around at his men. Not much different around here, is it, boys? No one said anything to agree with him. 
They didn't answer you, Jake sneered. That's because they knew I was being rhetorical, don't you? Yes, sir, they chorused in yipes and barks. All right, so you don't remember nothing, and you might have come from the same spot, but you're not sure. They transfer you around much? Doc and Steph shook their heads. Jake couldn't answer. Then we're going to move that down the list of possibilities. Y'all probably were in the same place. You remember how to get there? The train left from there, Doc answered. Straight shot to where you rescued us. That's how you're thinking on this, LT squinted. You think I rescued you? What else would you call it? I think you were planted on me. His bug designed to lead them to either HQ or a group like mine. Ain't no group like ours, LT, chirped Crockett. Damn straight, Crockett. But I ain't arrogant enough to think we're the only ones out here causing a row. He turned back to face the trio. Just the best at it. His men chuckled and agreed. Now that the bug is gone, they're going to be wondering what to do next. I bet they got radar on that base, don't they? It was Doc's turn to shrug. I've never been in the command center, he said. Me neither, Steph added. Well, we had that technology before they tried to send us back to the Stone Ages, so I suspect they do too. Or they're using ours. They're going to track those supply trucks. He turned to look over his shoulder at the squad. I figure while their eyes are looking one way, we can sneak on that base and gouge them out. The men nodded as they shared glances. That's a big target, LT, said Lutz. Yeah, Lutz, it is. But I've been thinking about something I read a long time ago. A man's reach should exceed his grasp. For what else are stars for? That's pretty, said Steph. What does it mean, said Lutz. It means dream big, snapped Jake. Yeah, that's what it means, LT said. You're dreaming if you think you can take on a whole base, said Jake, his eyes glaring at LT, then bouncing off the men around them. That dream's going to be a nightmare. Yeah, LT said. I figured it will be, but we're going to make some stops along the way. He stood up. We got a mission from on high, he told the squad. Message delivery service is our specialty now, and if we can run across a few licks along the way, you can add it to my collection. He turned back to the dock. You any good at ciphering? Breaking code? No, figuring out distance. Like if a train left a station traveling at 50 miles per hour, how long would it take to get from there to where we were stopped? Doc grinned. I had not thought of it like that. Yeah, you petties is full of book learning, but the common sense, he tapped his finger against his temple. Experience is what you get when you don't get what you wanted. We rested enough, let's move out. He pointed, and Danish hopped to. Leroy fell in behind him again as the rest assured their positions in line. Doc only groaned a little bit as he worked out the kinks with an exaggerated limp. 150 miles, he said to LT. I hope we don't have to walk that far. Doc, LT grinned, I like the way you think. Chapter 25 The nest mate called it a purge. Lit Commander called it delicious. The soldiers rounded up every human on the base, herding them like cattle onto an old abandoned runway and arranged them in a long line. He stood next to her on a raised platform in the back of a human transport truck, using it as an impromptu stage. There was no pomp or celebration, though. Once the soldiers had gathered every last human on the base and put them on the tarmac, they lined up opposite of them, separated by the crumbling black asphalt. Shall I? The nestmate said in a voice that sent a shiver of anticipation down his spine. Be my guest, he told her. She raised a three-fingered claw and dropped her arm. The soldiers opened fire, strafing the line of base servants with laser blast. 
Humans and bits of humans popped, boiled, and shattered as the rays of superheated light ripped through them. The smell of death and cooked meat permeated the runway after the shooting stopped in a few short minutes. The lit commander watched his companion's tongue flick in and out as she tasted it. Yellow eyes, narrow slits of pleasure. And now, she said, one of her claws tracing the uniform sleeve on his forearm, the replacements. It was his turn to give the signal, and the fleet of transport vehicles rumbled to life. The convoy departed the base, leaving the remains of the dead for the birds and insects to feast. Chapter 26 Where are we? Doc asked, his eyes taken in the surrounding landscape. Almost there, said LT. We got a place up here we're going to stop at for the night. He left out that they were meeting one of the outposts, a group of fighters the colonel wanted to bring into the fold and coordinate with. Doc didn't stop gaping, his head on a swivel as he tried to take it all in. He lost his balance twice and stumbled. LT called a halt. The older man spun in a slow circle, taking in the field that stretched to the horizon, the trees and sky. Been a long time since you were outside? Lutz asked. No. Doc took one more spin, then stopped to stare at LT. No. I need a map. Map don't do much good out here, Doc. Lick tore up most of the roads and cities. I know. I know. He wrung his hands, distracted. But I think we're close. We look close. What's he talking about? Babe stepped up next to LT and rested his bat on his shoulder. How the hell should I know? LT coughed. Hey, Doc, we got us some miles to go before we sleep. Who was that? Lutz asked. Robert Frost, said Babe. I haven't heard that since high school. Lucky, my dad quoted it almost every day. I know this place, Doc pleaded. I know where we are. That makes two of us, Doc. We're in a damn field exposed to every fucking lick that takes the time to look. We don't have time to stay out in the open like this. I mean, the place where our lab was. The place where we worked on it. Doc couldn't stop grinning. It's here. Where here? LT perked up. His movement put the rest of the men on high alert and they readied their weapons for a trap. Not here, said the doc as he pointed to the ground. You ain't making much sense. Doc took a deep breath and composed himself. As we were walking, the trees and terrain changed. We're in a new part of the country, are we not? LT looked at Danish, who nodded. Not much difference, said Danish. We move from pine country over to hill country. Yes, Doc clapped his hands with a small cheer. Well, good for you, Doc, said LT. I still ain't happy about being out here in the open. He motioned everyone to get moving. They did. But this view, Doc continued, opening his arms to take in the expanse of the horizon and sky. I've seen this view from a road. That road will lead us to the lab. All right. L.T. said to his back, I'm game. This the robot lab? More than that, Doc rubbed his hands. You wait. You'll be surprised. L.T. watched Steph and Jake, but neither reacted any different than his men as they continued through the field. He didn't relax until they reached the cover of the trees across the way and froze when a voice called out from above them. One move and you're dead. Chapter 27 If you shoot me, Cheryl, I'm going to fucking kill you, LT said from a frozen pose. Worthless son of a bitch like you, I'd be saving the lick a world of trouble. Don't talk about your mom like that. LT shifted around and grinned up at the tree branch. Jake couldn't see anything at first, not until the man called Cheryl moved. He was covered head to toe in camouflage blended into the bark of the tree so well, even his gun was hidden. 
He put the sling over his shoulder and dropped from the branch. Heard you might be coming. LT glanced up at the large man towering over him by almost six inches and twice as wide. The size of his chest and shoulder stretched the thin rifle strap to the point of bursting, but somehow it held. He had a bald head, painted like the rest of his face to match the bark. They set you out here to wait? Nah. Cheryl fell in beside LT as they continued through the woods. He didn't bother introducing himself to the rest as they fell in in line behind him. Just regular sentry. Kind of far out, ain't you? They won advance warning. HQ was doing some secret squirrel shit, and my boss didn't like it. Said they had the licks buzzing like hornets. Ain't easy for lizards, too. Cheryl hiccuped a quick laugh. No, I suppose it's not. Either way... I'm supposed to fire off a warning shot and then take out as many as I can to buy time. That's kamikaze shit. Cheryl nodded. Yeah, it don't sound right to me either. That's why I was up in the trees. Licks have trouble looking up. LT whistled low under his breath. They that desperate? Cheryl shrugged again. Hard times, brother. Hard times. They walked on in silence for a few more minutes. You the reason they're all riled up? Now, Cheryl, you know I've been doing my damn best to keep them riled up for a while now. More than usual? We hit a supply train. They had supplies? LT could almost hear his stomach gurgle in hunger. And them? LT used a thumb to point over his shoulder. Cheryl looked over his shoulder and eyed Doc, Steph, and Jake. Who are they? LT shrugged. Don't know yet. He says he's a doc, the petty kind, not the medicine kind. What kind of petty? Robots, right, doc? Nanotechnology and robotics, yes. Sounds like a petty, Cheryl grinned. You should hear if I let him go on. Likes the sound of his own voice. More than you like yours? You're hurting my feelings. Nobody likes the sound of their own voice more than I like mine, LT grinned. They reached cleared off space in the trees, 15 feet across. The felled trees had been used to build a wooden fort around metal buildings. I'm not coming in, Cheryl told the LT. Escort and sentry? The big man shrugged. Told you, secret squirrels. Ours is not to wonder why, LT sighed. All I do is wonder, Cheryl grunted and turned back into the woods. LT watched him go three steps, then the man stepped behind a tree and disappeared. He couldn't even hear his footsteps crushing the leaves. Babe, he called, let's take Leroy and circle this compound. Meet up on the other side. What if they start shooting at us? Babe stared at the pointed tips of the logs used to build the barricade. They know we're coming. They ain't going to shoot us. The men grumbled as he left and didn't hear him say, I hope, under his breath. Chapter 28 LT led the way around the wooden fort. He could feel eyes watching him from the woods Patches of silence in the trees when the insects weren't humming. More sentries. Watching the opening space from the forest to the fence. A killing field. He kept the woods close to his side. Watching the fence, then trees, then fence again. Head on a swivel. He would have felt better with his rifle up, but that might be too aggressive for the men watching him. Sure, they were on the same side, but he didn't need someone with an itchy trigger finger getting scared and starting a Bonnie and Clyde shootout. Three men waited for him as he approached the road to the gate. Is that you? The tallest one called out. Last time I checked. No accounting for taste, he said as LT got closer and held out his hand. They gripped forearms and the taller man pulled him into a one-armed shoulder hug. Damn, brother. It's good to see you. LT stared at the taller man, thin face brushed with a dark beard, long hair windswept and brushed back. 
That ain't regulation, he joked and lifted his own hat to show his dirty locks. We do what we can. If I had known they were going to send you to talk, the reception would have been different. This is Matthews, LT said over his shoulder to Danish and Crockett. We did some work together back at the beginning. Work? Matthews boomed, his white teeth gleaming under his beard. Not what you were doing now, but close. Yeah, we had some laughs. LT squared off on him, but now we're going to do something different. You get the colonel's plan? Matthews huffed. I guess you know it. I don't like it. LT nodded. I figured you ain't the only one. I'm here to ask nice. You know what I like best about the breakdown in command structure? Matthews wiped the grin off his face. They left me the hell alone to survive out here, until they need something. How many you got in there? Babe, Lutz, and Leroy appeared around the curve of the fence, moving slow and watching. Company of men, plus families, Matthews answered. We took in a couple of towns that were overrun. LT raised his eyebrows in disbelief. Matthews knew why. It doesn't look big, I know, but that's by design. We dug in, have half a damn city underground. We're on top of an old mine shaft, so that helped. And we've got double floors inside the structures. LT studied the fence, working the math out in his head for circumference. Still, he grunted, you must be damn near sleeping on top of each other. Hot racking triple bunks, Matthews groaned, using an expression to talk about three-story bunk beds and sleeping on them in shifts. Fuck. You can say that again. A bomb exploded behind Matthews in the middle of his group of men. It tossed LT up and back in a concussive wave that shook the trees. Babe, Leroy, and Lutz were knocked aside. LT rolled over in time to see Jake drag Steph into the woods. His ears were ringing from the explosion, and another followed on its heels, taking out the gate, splintering the thick trees. LT pawned for his gun, searching for the source of the artillery. Lick hovered transport zoomed up the only road in a straight line towards the compound. His hand landed on his weapon. He rolled over, flipped the switch, and sent a three-round burst into the lead hovercraft. The bullets bounced off the alloy as the men hidden in the trees opened up on the attackers. Babe sprinted out of the smoke and confusion, grabbed LT by the arm, and lifted him up. Lutz! LT screamed. He's got Leroy! Babe yelled back as lasers erupted from the convoy, slicing through trees. Branches fell, the tops of trees sliced in half, jumbled down, the screams of men as they fell aiding to the din. Babe dragged LT back the way they came. He saw Matthews dead on the ground, blue eyes staring at the smoke-filled sky, and sent another three rounds into the lick convoy. More blasts tore up the ground between them and the roadway in. Babe shoved him behind a tree and took cover behind another. LT shook his head, trying to clear it, but that just made the bells inside gong louder. He stared around for Danish, for Crockett and Waldo, saw them leaning around trees, shooting rounds into the licks. They were using single shots, careful aim locking lick soldiers from the back of the transports. He couldn't see the dock or Jake and Steph. Leroy and Lutz hadn't come back either. They needed to regroup, he thought. A superior force was bearing down on them, unknown numbers. Babe, he yelled. The big man stopped shooting and ducked behind his tree. Get gone, he screamed their code for strategic retreat. Babe nodded, passed the order to Crockett and Danish. He didn't wait to see if they followed as he dashed through the woods away from the battle. LT waited for Lutz. He glared around the tree and took a breath to scream out his name. A black dot dropped from the sky, hovered over the fort, and exploded. The force of the wave washed down into the compound and across the woods around it, knocking everyone inside and within 20 meters of the fence out cold. Chapter 29 
The nest mate stood in the back of the late transport and watched the bomb explode. This far away, she could only feel a slight ripple in the air as the wave washed over them, but several of the Lick soldiers in the car in front of them winced. The design was modified from a bunker buster bomb made by the humans. This one was created to explode mid-air, and like an EMP to electronics, this bomb turned off humans. A temporary short circuit in the electrical system that caused blackout and an hour or more of unconsciousness. She clapped her claws together in joy, her tongue practically dancing in the air as she tasted the crisp tart scent of laser burns, the smell of cooked human flesh, and more. Explosions, fear, rent dirt, and the gunpowder humans used to propel their projectile weapons. All of it delicious to her senses. She turned to see the Lick Commander staring at her, a peculiar expression on his face. She was nestmate to his eminence, but one of dozens, and he had never looked at her the way this commander stared. It stirred something in her, a longing. She hissed in a quick breath, her mouth open in a pant, and watched his eyes stare harder at her. Hunting humans, she said, I am not used to it. This battle is nothing. He waved a claw but didn't stop staring at her. The resistance they have left is meaningless. He said it to sound confident but watched her eyes drift away from him and back to the battle a half mile further up the road. He should have extolled her bravery, her willingness to participate in battle. It would have kept the sheen of excitement on her snout and put him in better graces with her. But instead, he had told her the truth and regretted it. The shooting from the woods died out as his soldiers fanned into the trees to capture the survivors. More soldiers poured out into the compound to begin the mop-up operation. Each body would be bound and tossed into the back of one of the hovercraft to be transported back to the base to serve the lick. He reached out, slow and brushed the skin on her arm with the tip of his claw. She jumped, but did not pull away. There is danger, he hissed. I did not mean to downplay it. I can still hear the fighters in the woods. It is brave to stay so close to it. He watched the muscles in her neck ripple in pleasure, the tongue slick in and out of her snout, searching for the smell of humans, of fighting. This is what you have been doing, she said, her voice purring in admiration. This and more. So different from hiding on the nest ship and ordering underlings through long-range transmission. He noted her use of the word hiding, her eyes still glowing with excitement. When they are done, he said, moving so he was closer to her, their arms brushing together, we will draw closer. She nodded. The lit commander was not sure, but it felt as if she leaned against him with a little more pleasure than before. Not fear, he thought, desire. His own tongue tasted the wind. He detected fear from the enemy, the sour tang of running and sweat drifting on the wind, almost overpowered by the smell of smoke and destruction, but still there. Run, he said to himself, for I will have my pick of who is inside the compound. Chapter 30 Jake ran with Steph through the woods. They dodged trees, leaped over fallen boughs, and put as much distance between the road leading to the fort and the battle as they could. Until he tripped. His foot caught on a root, sent him sliding face first on a carpet of leaves. He heard a whiz over his head, and seconds later, the crack of a rifle shot. Steph dropped to her knees next to him, pitched forward. He thought she had been hit as he crawled toward an overturned sapling that provided minimal cover, but she scrambled after him, hunched down next to him. Where are the others? she asked. I don't know, he whispered back. Jake wondered why the humans were shooting at them, when the woods would soon be full of lick soldiers. The tall lizard-faced aliens would trail them like bloodhounds, run them down, I didn't have time for some tree-hugging militia man to trap them in the forest. 
He didn't see the black shadow drop from the sky, but he felt the wave wham into him, slamming Steph across his lap and sending both of them into the darkness. He woke at twilight. At least that's how it looked. A fog of smoke filled the woods, filtering between the trees and giving everything an overworldly ghost-like appearance. He stretched out one hand first, then the next. Every muscle was sore from the energy wave pounding into him, and his legs were asleep because of the heavy body laying over them. He shoved Steph by the shoulder. Wake up, he said. The woods around them were silent. The battle must have been over, he thought. Steph stirred and lifted off off of him with a grimace of pain. What was that? She worked out the kinks in her neck. He shrugged and tried to stand, then remembered the man in the tree shooting at them. Think he's gone? He whispered. Who? The sniper, Jake pointed over his shoulder. If that bomb or whatever it was got us, it got him too. Maybe he fell out of the tree. They helped each other stand, fighting for balance on wobbly legs for a few moments until the pins and needles in his thighs subsided. Then they lurched through the leaves away from the direction of the fort. Now that they were standing, Jake could hear the rumble of hover jets moving on the road. We need to put some miles between us, he said. Steph nodded, dark circles under her eyes. Head hurts, she told him. Mine too. Ears? She shook her head. Ringing. Sore. All of me is sore. What was that? He shrugged again. They found the sniper hanging upside down from a sling in the tree branch. The man had flipped as he lost consciousness, twisted over, and strangled himself with the rifle strapped around his neck. He couldn't have done that if he tried, said Jake. He reached up, undid the strap, and armed himself. He took a lock blade knife and pistol from a holster on his waist and passed them to Steph. She checked the clip in the pistol and slammed it back home with the neat efficiency of someone familiar with it. She clicked the safety and slid it into the waist of her pants and slipped a lock blade in her pocket. I feel better now, she told him as she glanced around. Do you think they'll come this way? Jake listened to the rumble of the hovercraft for a moment. They sound stationary. They make a whining sound when they move, right? I think so. Do you think we're the only ones who made it? He shook his head. I think the woods are full, he said. That first guy we ran into is still out here. I don't want to be here when he wakes up. Where are we going to go? She asked. I want to go see what the aliens are doing. If they're not shooting, they're taking prisoners, said Jake. That's the only thing they do. She shuddered. How did you end up with them? I don't know. I don't remember. She shivered again. I do. They came to town and took everyone. There weren't many of us, but the aliens got us all. What did they do with you? He started walking slow through the woods, careful of where he would put his feet. She followed in his footsteps. Workers, she said. Slave labor. You? I don't remember. That's right. You said that. She massaged her head. That explosion made me a little loopy. They continued on in silence for 400 yards. Jake glanced up sharply, and she bumped into the back of him before she could stop. What is it? She whispered as his head darted around. She searched for the pistol in her pants. Stop, Babe said. Don't. Her hand froze over the butt of the gun, then she lifted it in surrender. Babe stepped out from behind an oak. Danish, Crockett, Waldo, and Doc surrounded them. You made it, said Doc. So did you. Not without them. He pointed to Crockett and Waldo. They dragged me off. Are we far enough away? Jake grunted. He eyed the group of soldiers. Their weapons were different, like they had picked up new ones on the flight through the forest. Maybe they found more hanged men in the trees like him. What about the other one? He grunted again. Lieutenant, said Waldo. He made it. Where? They looked around the woods. He's out there, Crockett answered. Sent us to get you. 
How did he know where we were? I told him, Cheryl said from behind them. Jake turned to face the big man from their first encounter. How did you know? I was further out, Cheryl explained. I don't think I was out as long as anyone closer to the blast radius. You seen that before? Babe asked. We haven't. We haven't seen them use that weapon before. Like a giant concussive grenade, Doc explained. He tugged on his earlobe like he was trying to clear it of an obstruction. My ears are ringing, Steph confessed. All of ours, said Waldo. Muscles, too. She nodded. We'll feel like that for days, said Doc. We ain't got days. LT marched out of the dampled shadows between the trees. He stopped at the edge of the clearing and squinted at what was left of his squad and the newcomers and the sniper. They got Lutz, he growled. Leroy's dead. Babe and Waldo cursed under their breaths. Fucking licks are picking up the bodies and stacking them in hover jets, LT continued. Planning on taking them back to their base, I suppose. Cheryl shifted his rifle in his arms. We gonna harass and dash? No, I suppose not, said LT. Ain't none of them awake to fight back if the licks start a wholesale slaughter and dump the bodies. I figure they're going to take them somewhere and use them. Slaves, said Steph. What we were, she indicated Jake in the dock. Well, they got Lutz, and as far as I know, he didn't sign on to be nobody's slave. So we're going to go get him. We'll need better guns, LT, said Babe. And I lost my bat. Damn, Babe, how are you going to hit any home runs if he ain't got a bat? I grew up playing stickball. I could just get a right-sized branch. I seen a dead guy in a tree, said LT, his eyes stopping on the weapon in Jake's hand. That where you got that? Jake nodded. We'll need to hunt up some more. Cheryl, you know anybody else survived? Not without looking. I don't have my ESP on. Then go take a look around, why don't you? See who you can round up. Cheryl nodded and melted into the shadows under the trees. May I make a suggestion? Doc asked. I'm all ears, Doc. I may know where weapons are cached. LT squinted at him with a glint to his glower. You have my interest. It's a long walk, said the bespectacled man. Then tell me on the way. Chapter 31 That it? Doc nodded. Shit, Doc. That don't look like much. They were on top of a ridge staring down an industrial park built on the edge of a river port. The buildings looked like cheap metal construction, tall 24-foot arched roofs plopped in a sea of concrete parking lots. A hurricane fence surrounded some buildings, 12 feet of rusting metal swaying in the wind a spooky silence blanketing the area. It's not supposed to look like much, Doc said as he stared down at the abandoned buildings. By design. You ain't pulling my leg, are you, Doc? Because that kind of fooling is really going to piss me off. Pissing me off makes my trigger finger itch. Babe slapped a thin branch on his shoulder with a meaty thwack. Makes me want to play ball, he said. Doc licked his lips and adjusted his glasses. I know, it doesn't look like what you expected, but they were plain clothes security officers stationed outside when I worked there, as well as redundant systems inside. The idea was we could be overlooked if anyone was interested in our research. He indicated the area below. And it seems to have worked. The invaders didn't destroy this place as they have so many others. That gives me reason to believe that what we want may still be inside. You said cached, like you knew it was there. He shrugged with a sheepish half grin. I suspect they are still there, but it's been three years. LT glared at him again, then around at the others. All right, he said after a moment. We're going to go down there and take us a look. Y'all get moving and I'll catch up. Danish took point and led the group down in a staggered line. Bay brought up the rear, 
eyes drilling holes into the back of Doc's head. Cheryl, hold up, LT said in a soft voice. I need overwatch up here. Bonnie's eyes flickered to the long rifle strapped to Cheryl's back. The big man didn't argue or say a word. He just dropped to a knelt position and rested the rifle on his knee. You see anything looks out of place? Pop it. Got it, LT. And keep an eye on that kid with the rifle. He makes a move to aim it at one of us. Stop him. Cheryl squinted up at him with one eye open. You don't trust him? Shit, Cheryl. I don't trust any of them. You think this is a trap? Or a long con, said LT as he started through the grass to catch up with the group. Either way, stay eyes up and keep my boys safe. Cheryl turned his eye back to the scope locked to the top of his rifle. He danced across the back of Doc, Steph, and Jake's head, then swept the fence line searching for threats. LT caught up with Babe and fell in step behind him. I don't like this, LT. What's not to like? We got open ground, unknown entrenchment up ahead, lots of corners, dark places, and limited ammo and weapons. Hell, babe, we're bushwhacking the shit out of this fight. I got a stick, babe grumbled in a half-hearted attempt to joke. Then that's all we need, LT grunted back. You can shove it up the ass of anyone who tries to stop us. That doc, if this is another ambush. I don't think he had anything to do with that last place. He almost got killed with us. Maybe that was the plan. He kamikazed it. LT was quiet for a while, mulling it over in his head. I don't see it like that. Too many chances of it going wrong. Then what tipped off the licks? Why did they attack when we got there? I don't know, babe. I don't like not knowing, LT. Me either. Danish reached the fence and turned towards the entrance several hundred yards further away. LT stopped in the path and readied his rifle as he studied the exterior of the buildings. He didn't see anything. No glint of sun on moving glass. No shadows flickering where they weren't supposed to be. It looked like a giant derelict storehouse. Danish made the entry and slipped inside. He pulled up behind a guard shack and waited for the others to join him. When LT arrived, he locked eyes with Doc. Which one? Last building on the left. LT peeked around the corner. A small brown door was on one side of the building, with a row of four roll-up doors lined up beside it. I don't like it, Waldo said. Single point of entry, LT muttered. It's a damn barrel shoot for whoever goes in. You think someone's in there? Jake asked. I always plan like someone's in there. They couldn't get in, Doc said in an exaggerated whisper. The codes wouldn't work once the backup power supplies went down. What's it look like inside? There is a second structure inside the building with more sealed rooms inside of that. LT stared at the still intact windows at the top. They were covered with grime, smog and grit from years of exposure. It meant not much light inside. As far as he could tell from the approach, there weren't any windows on the exterior walls, just the row at the top of the structure. Skylights on the roof, he asked. Doc startled. Yes, our part of the green initiative. LT gave Waldo a look. We get in and work up one of the rolled up doors, spread more light in the place, then we see what we've got. Crockett, Waldo answered. The two men slid around the side of the building and ran in a crouch towards the door. LT watched and worried. He knew Cheryl would have eyes on them, but once the door was open, the man would have no shot. That meant his two men would be exposed to anyone shooting inside, like firing at silhouettes on a range. He wanted to run with them, provide additional cover when the door opened, but held back. Danish, he ordered, get in front of that first roll-up and get ready to kill anything that moves in there that ain't one of ours. Danish pounded across the concrete and set up outside of the door. Babe, other side. Babe slipped around the other side of the guard shack and trained his weapon on the roll-up door too. 
What about me? Jake asked. LT gave the rifle in his hand a look. Be ready to run, he advised and turned back to the warehouse. Waldo and Crockett reached the door and grabbed the handle. He jerked on it, but the door didn't move. He tried again harder with the same results. Locked, he called out. Well, shit, Doc, why didn't you say something? I didn't know to say anything. Code won't work on an electric lock? The doc shook his head. Break it, LT shouted back to Waldo. There went the element of surprise if there were people inside. Waldo drew back his boot and slammed it into the doorknob. It took two more kicks before the metal ball broke free and clattered to the ground. Waldo jerked the door open and ducked his head around the edge. No one shot at him. He slid into the door and disappeared in the darkness to one side. LT knew he was setting up a cover field of fire. Then Crockett slipped in with them and they waited. 30 seconds later, the roll-up door trundled open with a rattle of rusty chains. LT still couldn't see his men, which was a good thing. Meant they were staying on the side of the door, making minimal targets in the light as it flooded the inside of the warehouse. Danish gave an all-clear signal, but kept his weapon aimed inside. LT led Doc, Jake, and Steph towards a new opening in the wall. Babe following them, they reached the entrance and scrambled inside. Textbook, LT called out to Waldo. He stepped out of the shadow, a gun barrel placed against his head. The man behind him was dressed head to toe in black, tinted goggles under a riot helmet hiding his eyes. Drop your weapons, the man said, his voice muffled under a baklava over his mouth. They heard other weapons click in the darkness as several figures stepped out of the shadows, all dressed in black, all with MP5s aimed at them. LT held up his rifle in one hand, raised his other in surrender. Shit, Doc, he sighed. You got me. Chapter 32 I had nothing to do with this, Doc mumbled. You have three seconds to tell me what you're doing in my camp, a voice called out of the darkness. Hands are up, John Wayne. Let's not turn this into an okay corral situation. That was Wyatt Earp, the voice shot back. I ain't planning to write a book about it, LT said. Just want you to know we're friendlies. Nobody needs to shoot nothing. You broke into here, kicked in my door. I've got a right to stand my ground. Nobody is saying you don't, said LT, hands still up. Fact is, if the boot was on the other foot, I'd damn sure be thinking about it just like you. Then tell me why we shouldn't. You hear much from the outside, LT asked. We looped in, because I'm Lieutenant William Bonney. Billy the Kid? LT grumbled and shifted his weight. I suspect you heard of my boys and what we've been doing to fight the licks. Maybe. Maybe then you know that killing us ain't in the best interest of humanity and such. I'd be in my rights, though. The voice still hid behind their sight. Of course you would, said LT. Ain't nobody denying that as a fact. You have a right to defend what's yours. The thing is... I've been out there making hell so you can keep what's yours away from the lick. There was no answer. LT let his eyes adjust to the dim interior. The one man was still holding Waldo, but the others hadn't moved. He could see a wall 15 feet further in. It ran the length of the building and all the way to the roof, turning the space by the roll-up doors into a long, narrow corridor. His eyes shifted over the men in black standing as still as statues. None of them shifted their weapons, no rattling of the gear that weighed down their vest they wore. He studied Doc's profile. As he stared at their captors too, his eyebrows were crinkled in confusion. LT's eyes settled on Waldo. The gun was still pressed to his temple, but he shifted his body to one side, his hand hanging down near the groin of the man holding him. A quick punch or grab and squeeze could either get him free or spread his head across a swept concrete floor. Swept concrete. 
LT's eyes traveled as far as a light would let them. The inside of the building was swept and maintained. No dust or debris inside. A far cry from the derelict exterior. How many of you are there? He called out. The men still not moving. He locked eyes with Waldo and mouthed the countdown. One, two, three. LT shifted right and lifted his rifle towards a man holding Waldo. At the same time, Waldo punched back with his fist and dropped to the ground. The man howled and collapsed next to Waldo, cupping his groin and mewling. Waldo scooped up his rifle and aimed it at the men in black. Hold it! LT yelled and took two quick strides towards Waldo. He knelt down on the chest of the man on the ground, while Babe, Danish, and the others fanned out, weapons trained on the darkness. How did you know? Doc stammered. Know what? That they wouldn't shoot. Show him, Babe. Babe stepped forward with the stick, drew back like a bat, and swung into one of the helmets. The head sailed off into the corridor, bouncing on the floor twice before spinning to stop next to the wall. Steph gave a small scream. How did you know? Jake asked. Get out of the light, LT told him. There's still one more out there. Jake ducked out of the light of the doorway and aimed into the darkness. They weren't moving, he explained. Mannequins. That was a big chance you took with our lives, Jake muttered. Yeah, I did, said LT. You still out there? Don't shoot. I haven't yet. Don't hurt, my friend, the voice sounded flustered, or I'll kill all of you. You got any bullets? LT snorted. I figure if he had bullets, one of us would be dead already. He ripped the gun off the fallen man who had grown still and silent under him as he caught his breath and checked the magazine. Empty, he shouted in triumph. Danish, check those others. I'll shoot him, the voice screamed. I bet you won't, said LT. I don't want to get shot, LT. He ain't going to shoot us, Danish. He would have done it. Danish ducked and ran. He plowed into one of the men in black, wrestled the gun loose, and checked it. Empty. LT helped the fallen man under him up, set him on his feet, and held him straight. Now why don't you come on out here, and let's figure this out, said LT. They heard footsteps and shuffling in the darkness. A short, skinny man with a shining, bald head slipped into the light from the open rolling door. He held an impotent gun in shaking hands as he stared at LT. Don't hurt my friend, he licked his lips. Please. LT held the man up by the black tactical vest. Ain't nobody else getting hurt. His eyes were narrow slits. Yet. Crockett, get us some light in here. I can help with that, said the short man. He reached the wall and pulled the cord. Blinds that covered the skylights drew back as he yanked on the rope, bathing the corridor in milky sunshine. Son of a bitch, said LT as light washed over the rest of the room. Chapter 33 The 15-foot corridor stretched the length of the building. The areas around the roll-up doors were surrounded by black-clad mannequins set up on rolling dollies. Beyond them was a camp. Tents lined the walls, shacks built from scrap and garbage, sheds with walls made of frayed and faded blue tarps. People huddled in front of and inside them. The short, bald man blinked his eyes fast in the sunlight. Please don't hurt us, he pleaded. LT studied the camp. People were coming out of their tents, drawn by the light as if it was a signal. They froze at the sight of the armed men still by the door. The door is open, the man beside LT said in a grovelly voice. They'll see us. The bald man made a tentative motion towards the door. Can we just please down, please? LT caught Crockett's eye. Do it. Crockett reached up and rolled the door down with a resounding clang. The shadowed twilight washed over the corridor. The people inside were silent, watching as LT considered. It's a pretty good setup you got here. He turned to face the bald man. What's your name? Burmage, the man answered fast. Burmage? 
said Doc and stepped closer to the man. The big blinking eyes watered as they fluttered, staring at the man in front of him. Weber? Then the two men hugged, slapped each other on the back and broke away. The bald man sobbed as he held onto Doc's upper arm with one hand. I take it you know each other, said Waldo. We work together, said Doc in wonder. I thought you left. I did, but we came back after. Are there more of you? Doc indicated the hundred or so people milling about the corridor watching them. This is all we have. What kind of work do you do together? LT squinted at the two men. You a petty too? Petty? Doctor, said Doc. He is. We are in the same area of research. Two doctors after the world ends, and neither one of them a medic, Babe muttered. Yeah, that don't seem right, does it? LT said back. We can't have two docs running around. Things are going to get confusing. Why aren't you in the lab? Doc asked Burmage. There would be more room inside. We can't get in, he said. How long have you been here? LT interrupted them. Burmage shrugged. Time is a little different now, he said with a rueful shake of his head. Who can see us out there? Jake growled. Who was watching? Burmage glanced at the door as if whoever was out there had x-ray vision and could see through the metal. The aliens, of course, he said, and there is a rival camp not too far from here. Rivals, LT scoffed. We're all in this together. Burmage gave him a sad look as if staring at a man who no longer understood the kind of world they were living in. If only that were true, he said. LT ignored him. He figured he knew a lot more about what was going on outside than some nut who locked himself in a closet for the past year. At least that's how long he thought, based on the setup of the camp inside. Why are they so quiet? Danish asked. LT and Babe looked at him, but he was watching the people he could see in the corridor. Pools of weak light drifted through the skylights and created pockets of brighter space punctuated by strips of darkness. Thin and emaciated faces drifted in and out of the half-light. Sunken eyes framed by stringy hair watched them in fear. They don't know who you are, said Burmage. We don't know. Don't know what, Waldo whispered. What you want. Tell him, Doc. I'll show him, Doc said, and started in the direction opposite the door. Burmage startled with a squeak and fell in step with him. The rest of the squad followed, Babe walking backwards so he could keep an eye on the crowd. They didn't go far. Doc led them to a solid brown metal door set into the wall, a big black box next to it. It was the only opening in the interior wall. He tried the knob. We tried that, said Burmage. Weber nodded and tapped a code into the metal keypad next to the door. Nothing happened. We tried that too. Waldo pushed the dock aside and rammed his shoulder in the door. Nothing. He pulled back his boot and slammed it against the knob. It didn't move. Waldo danced around, cursing and holding the bottom of his bruised foot. We tried everything, said Burmage. Steph pushed through the tiny knot of soldiers hovering in front of the door and ran her hands along the edge of the wall around it. She pulled the lock blade from her pocket and clicked it open with a snap. Steph set the point against the wall two inches from the door and used her palm to slam the blade through the drywall. She carved down with a bit of effort, using her body weight to saw the blade through the sheetrock. Powdered dust drifted to the floor as the men stared open-mouthed at what she was doing. She reached the bottom and moved three feet over to repeat the process. LT slid his knife out of the sheath and held the blade out to crock it. The soldier joined Steph and sawed a line along the top, connected the two lines, then pried it out as she stepped back. A doorway-sized section of the interior wall fell away, showing pink fiberglass insulation and another plywood wall beyond. They ripped out the plywood, then Steph and Crockett sawed an opening into the inside of the wall. My dad was in construction, she explained, before. LT patted her on the shoulder with the tips of his fingers. 
Good work. Steph beamed. Danish, get us some lights up in here. See if they have fire to make torches or something. That won't be necessary, said Doc. All the systems are offline, Burmage told him. Not these. Doc stepped through the hole in the wall and entered the darkness. They heard him fumble around for a few moments, grumbling. Then a soft click, and row after row of LED lights flickered on inside the corridor and the room behind the wall. Gasps and cheers sounded from the assembled people around the tents. Sounds of wonder and joy, almost out of place against such a medieval backdrop. Son of a bitch, said LT. Doc stuck his head around the corner with a big grin. Let there be... Babe, LT nodded him to check it out. Babe used the tip of his stick to push Doc away from the edge and leaned in, peeking first. He stepped through and let out a whistle. LT hunched down to one knee to peer through the opening. An open lab space stretched out in front of them. Metal tables, workbenches, transparent plastic boards with the remnants of markings on them. Debris littered the workbenches, soldering irons, tools, pieces of metal, and chipboards. The lights still work because of our solar system, said Doc as he glanced up at them. They're dim. Brightest light I've seen in a long time, Doc, LT told him. Burmage wept, leaning against the door. Why is he crying? Waldo asked. Lights are a good thing. Inches, Burmage sobbed. We have suffered so long, and this was inches away. We can get people on the roof to clean the panels embedded up there, said Doc. We'll get more power. LT moved through the opening, followed Crockett. Waldo, Danish, hold this line, he ordered. The two soldiers stood on either side of the door to act guard and keep the rest out. We want to see too, Jake argued. You wouldn't be in there if it wasn't for her. Thanks for getting us through the wall, LT said to Steph. Now stay here and don't fucking move until we check it out. She nodded and stepped back next to Waldo so she could cover one end of the corridor. Jake grumbled, but he set up next to Danish to cover the other side. LT waved Doc forward. Why don't you give us the nickel tour? Chapter 34 Doc led them into the bowls of the interior room. LT studied the corners to get a hint of the size of the place. It was almost as large as the warehouse it was hidden inside. He wondered if the corridor stretched on all four sides. Wondered if it was as packaged with refugees and people as hiding as much as the one they broke into. We need a civilian head count, he said to Babe as they followed the dock to another door in another wall a smaller box within the box. And a weapons check, Babe said. Think any of them play baseball? He patted his shoulder with the stick. You might be the last ball player left on earth, LT answered. Makes me kind of sad. Yeah, me too. But it means you're the best ball player left on earth, so you've got that going for you. Doc opened the door to the next room, and LEDs automatically flickered to life. No lock on that one, Doc? No need. If you got into the first workshop, you were cleared for everything inside. And what's inside? Doc stepped back and ushered them through. LT whipped up his rifle and aimed it at a massive figure standing to one side of the door. Whoa, whoa, Doc screamed. Don't shoot. LT held his fire but noticed Babe had readied his weapon as well. This is it. Doc said in a fast voice, This is what I was telling you about. LT glared at the figure in front of him. It was on a mannequin that much was obvious. He should have seen the details of the smooth features on the face, should have noted the wooden hands. But all he saw was the gear, a suit, modeled on the riot gear on the pretend army that greeted them when they busted through the door. This suit looked more advanced. Body armor? guessed Babe. Much more, said Doc as he tapped a panel on the chest plate. It popped open to show a circuit board. We built the prototype to send to Mars before we lost there, he said. His fingers tapped in a code on the armor. 
This is an exoskeleton ceramic body armor with strengthening augmenting mechanical joints. English doc, LT side, we ain't petties. It's a suit of armor with a brain, he said. We programmed it to make you stronger, make better soldiers. Blast proof, 360 protection. He twirled the helmet around from the back of the head and showed it to them. Heads up VR display, reticular targeting, and he pointed to a chrome bench on the wall. Fucking laser cannons, LT grinned. First generation, said Doc. We stole the alien design and reverse engineered it. Not as powerful as the weapons they're using now, but still effective, I think. LT stared at the suits and did a quick head count of them hanging on racks in the room. You build six of these? Doc kept moving to the back of the room. LT and Babe followed. There were pieces lying on a long workbench ready to be assembled. I didn't build them, said Doc. Not by myself, but the team working here did. He stared at LT with a hard look in his eyes. When we shut this place down, I never thought we'd be back. I thought it was the end of the human race. We sent our best to Mars, and they lost. But now, now there might be hope, LT grunted. They weren't sending the best to Mars, not at the end at least. They were sending whoever they could to slow them down. But the fucking lick was coming to Earth no matter what we threw at them. He strode back to the wall and lifted one of the blaster rifles. It was lighter than he expected, and it must have shown on his face. Ceramic alloy, said the doc. Like the suit, their construction, we just borrowed it. Yeah, I like the idea of killing licks with their own technology. That gives me a tingling feeling in my pants. What you think, babe? Babe stood in front of one of the suits, ran his finger along the ridge plate at the shoulder. No room for a bat, he said, but I'll make do. LT nodded. All right, Doc, you weren't much of a medicine man, but you just might have made up for it with this. If it works, said Babe. It works, said Doc, a weapon to fight against the aliens on their own terms. We've been bushwhacking the shit out of the lick, said LT. Now we've got some firepower to go with it. Amateur hour is over, babe. It's time to go pro. Babe grinned and slid one of the suits off the rack. He started to shrug it on. It needs skin contact, said the doc. Here, let me help. LT watched as he helped Babe suit up inside the armor. It took almost 10 minutes to get him locked in. Only the helmet remained. How's it feel? Like a second skin. That's by design, said the doc. The suit has sensors in it to monitor performance, both of the equipment and the person wearing it. Babe moved around the room. He picked up the fallen stick and swung it through the air. It whistled in an arcing blur. LT, he huffed in wonder. Yeah, babe, looks like you got a little starch in your swing. That's going to send some heads on a home run. Go get the others, LT told him and turned to the dock as Babe marched to the cut doorway on the exterior of the room. We're going to suit up, he told the man. We're going to get Lutz and we're going to unleash the hounds of hell. Chapter 35 The Lick Commander nestled on the lounge with the nestmate, satiated and spent. Her excitement at winning the battle against the humans had turned into a passionate romp between the two of them. Now they rested together as he stared at a monitor overlooking the new slave prisoners. They were waking, moving slow, but they would improve as orders were given. He flicked his tongue in and out, tasting the air for victory. It smelled like the nestmate. She would help him. He knew it. She would aid him in reclaiming this planet and in recovering his status with his eminence. He just needed a plan. As if she read his thoughts, her snout turned to him and flickered a question. Am I not enough to hold your interest? She hissed with lower eyelids. He could tell she wasn't angry, but curious. You are my interest, he hissed back. And now that you have won a battle over the humans, I wonder if you are ready for more. 
She clicked one of her claws along the scales on his chest. I am always ready for more, she told him. It was a shortcoming of his eminence. He thought me dumb, another of his playthings in the nest. Had he recognized my potential, perhaps things would be different. The lit commander nodded. I recognize, he told her. She nestled her face into him. He could feel her breathing. I know, she said. Together we will do great things, starting with this planet. He thrilled to hear it voice and wiggled closer to her. He would make a plan with her and a backup plan, just in case she thought he was expendable. The humans were going to pay for their revolution. Thank you for listening to Beachhead, Invasion Earth. Written by Chris Lowry, narrated by Rob Lay. Find out what happens next in Bridgehead, Invasion Earth, Book 2 and the Nine Book Series.